Okay, so this is wild for me. This is a very big day for me. I don't get starstruck by celebrities. I don't care. I find most of them disappointing, frankly. I do get starstruck by neuroscientists and neurology professors. <laughs> so you, this, this actually is a very big deal for me. Ask the producers. I changed. Did I not wear a dress and then change into something else before he got here? Yes, you did. Wow. <laughs> I, I put a dress on and then I started sweating and panicking. So then I took it off and now I'm put a sweater on, which was even dumber. So I'm fully flustered. I want to just say that out loud. I don't get flustered by celebrities. I get flustered by scientists. Um, people that listen to this podcast know that I'm obsessed with neurology. Um, in fact, I believe I know more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you very well may. And if you disagree with anything I say, I'll just cut it out. <laughs> Sounds good. So this is like a, a crazy honor for me. Do you want to just introduce yourself so I don't screw it up? Sure. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neuroscience and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. So neuroscience, unlike neurology, is not the clinical field. Right. So I should just give a disclaimer right off the bat. So I'm not a medical doctor. That means I'm not an MD, which means I don't prescribe anything. Damn I'm a, it. I'm a research scientist and a professor, so I profess a lot of things. <laughs> so. And people that know me know that this podcast, like this is fulfilling the promise of what I wanted to do with this podcast, which was get these brilliant minds in a room, picking their brain. Uh, I want it to be like the Robin Hood of science and neurology and um, therapy and psychotherapy and psychology and stuff so that uh, people could get this information because I'm lucky enough to be able to meet people like you and I wanted to give them um, an opportunity to get inside your head for free. So this is like my dream. Um, I also just want to say real quick that Andrew was just on Rogan. It was a brilliant interview. I'm going to try to not cover a lot of the same things you guys talked about. This podcast is more through the lens of sex, relationships, good relationships, bad relationships, family relationships, work situations, sort of how to edify yourself in all parts, um, opposed to like athletic performance or something. We don't care about working out over here. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I'm, I'm going to keep guiding towards that. I recommend that everybody listen to the Rogan interview. It's unbelievably um, educational and elegant. You're, it's, it's very rare that you're able to get a scientist or a doctor who is charismatic and, and able to convey what they know in a way that people that aren't scientists can understand. Thank you. You know, so you, like you make it simple enough for dumb people like me to actually understand. And I'm going to No, say, no, you know a lot of neuroscience. We were talking out there. You know a lot about science <laughs> like, and science history. I'm not just saying that. Like your knowledge is pretty vast. I true. I am obsessed. You spend time on it. I, clearly. It's my it's my number one passion is neurology. And, and let me tell you why. It's just so we can frame this podcast and this conversation, because this is like this is such a big deal for me. And I'm I'm just so excited, you know. I've spent a lot of my life, and I'm not going to say it's just because I'm a woman. I think men, you know, get this too. We're taught at a very young age that everything is our fault. And we're taught, you know, I think as, as a woman, you hear a lot, relax, calm down, you're psycho, you're crazy, you're too emotional, you're too sensitive. You know, and I think for the longest time, I didn't really understand why I made the decisions I made. Um, I just thought, I was bad in some way. And once I started learning about neurology, I actually think it's like a crime that we don't teach neurology in high schools to understand how your brain works and a lot of the decisions that are made for you instead of your conscious decisions. Um, and now, you know, I think st learning neurology helped me have so much more patience with myself and so much more uh, love and respect for myself of going like, okay, you know, I'm really upset in the situation, but that's adrenaline and cortisol and, you know, uh, this reaction is something that would have served me very well in tribal times. Like my brain is very well evolved for a conflict, you know, a thousand years ago, <laughs> but circumstances have changed and now this tool is obsolete and even maybe a liability at this point. So being able to look at your choices and your reactions and your emotions through the lens of understanding neurology to me is just like the key to being patient with yourself, the key to being hopeful, especially some of the work that you're doing around neuroplasticity, the key to going like, you know what, I can change myself. I don't, I'm not doomed to turn into my mother. I'm not doomed to constantly recreate my childhood circumstances. Like I'm not doomed to be in bad relationships forever, you know? So to me, this is the key to feeling hope and patience and self-respect and love. So this is just, it's such a, a big deal for me. Well, it's the right topic if you're interested in yourself or if people are interested in themselves and, or interested in other people, what makes them tick? Mm -hmm. I mean, the nervous system, which is the brain and all the connections with the body and back again, essentially controls all our experience. 
I mean, everything, the immune system, digestion, heartbeat, gut microbiome, all that stuff is great and important, but it's actually all controlled by the nervous system in the brain. And, and it's amazing how little we, you know, I, I, it's just so shocking to me that when I do talk about, you know, um, I'm obsessed with weighted blankets and, you know, whether it's placebo or not, but when my sympathetic nervous system is activated, I'm like, I need to get into my parasympathetic. And I'm like, what does that mean? And I'm like, how is this not just part of our everyday um, conversation of how we talk to each other? Yeah. So there are a couple of reasons why I think people don't know more about the brain probably three reasons. One is that a lot of the best information is recent. Mm. It's only really come out in the last 10 to 15 years. The second reason is that there aren't a lot of scientists who are leaving their laboratories and talking to the general public. Yes, they're busy. Yeah. And of the ones that do, um, they vary in terms of how narrowly focused they are or how much of the field they read about and understand. Um, I'm, you know, part of the reason I'm here and I've been doing podcasts is I really, I want to be an educator. I want to teach people about themselves and about the brain. And I think I would like to also put out the call for more scientists to do similar sorts of things. And then the third reason is that the naming is terrible. So as yeah, you pointed out, it's like <laughs> sympathetic nervous system is like, so true. Has, it actually is the kind of more stress related aspect yes. of the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, which means automatic isn't even an, uh, automatic. It's not autonomic. And so the naming is terrible. So medical nomenclature and science nomenclature is Horrendous. not, it's, de it's designed so that everyone's on the same page who works on that particular thing. Right. And it almost seems as if it's designed to keep everybody else out of some secret club, <laughs> yes. but it's not. It's just the naming is terrible. Mm -hmm. So for those of you out there that are listening to this, I, I, and because you brought it up, the sympathetic nervous system is the aspect of our brain and its connections with the body that makes us feel more alert, mm -hmm. that makes our breathing speed up, that makes us kind of stressed. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the one that makes us more calm. The so-called rest and digest system is the one that triggers sexual arousal, incidentally. So there now no one will forget it. <laughs> and it, literally, these are two different, you know, your sympathetic nervous system is just from here to your navel. Mm -hmm. It's the neurons that trigger the, all that activation and the release of adrenaline More and so. everything right here. And the parasympathetic nervous system, para just means near. Sympa means together. So it all happens at once. That's why stress is like, boom, all so at once. So you have to know Latin in order to figure these things out. Basically, or Greek. Yeah. That's too much. And then the parasympathetic nervous system is the neck. It's the neurons that live along the spinal cord in the neck mm -hmm. and in the pelvic area below the navel. And those control other things, right? Many other things. And so like voice, reproductive behavior, defecation, urination, all these kinds of things. So, but the naming is just dreadful. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do and I'm rallying my colleagues to do is to try and come up with a nomenclature yeah. that can evolve to a place where more people can understand it. Right. It's going to take some time mm -hmm. because doctors need to speak doctor speak right. and scientists need to speak science speak. But I think it is important. Today, I'll do my best to not use many and hopefully no acronyms. But we don't need Thank more you. acronyms. Yes. Um, but if I do use them, I'll um, be careful to and you do a great things. job at saying like the fear center of the brain, the reward center of the brain. I try. You know, I did a movie on, about neurology and I, it took me, I'm not even joking you, a week to learn the word phenylethylamine. <laughs> I literally just walked around my house and like phenylethylamine, like it was like, it's actually uh, physically difficult. <laughs> it's a mouthful. And then, you know, people would, you know, will contact me and say, well, you know, you were lumping this and this together. I think there's a way to have a conversation about science, neuroscience, neurology, immunology in a way that um, my hope is that it'll be clear and that it'll also some elements will be actionable. Because I think information is great, but there are great tools to extract from the field of neuroscience that people can implement, uh, regardless of financial status, et cetera, mm -hmm. that can make their lives better and can help each other. And so I... I Yes, I'm basically saying I agree. I think that more people need to understand science. Mm -hmm. um, I'm heavily biased in <laughs> uh, in my uh, belief in that. But um, anyway. But I just know I want people to like, because people often look to me uh, as some like mental health guru. And how did you learn to love yourself? And how did you learn to have high self-esteem? And how did you learn to avoid conflict? And, you know, we say a lot on this show, like the only way to win is to not play. Don't get into the ring. Don't, you know, if someone asks you to dance, just don't like all of sort of the ability to control your impulses, you know, is something the ability to have something that we call pause, the ability to say, you know what, I'm not going to engage in this fight. You know, what? I'm not going to respond to this email right now to not be so reactive, because I think especially now with what's going on and we're all at like, you know, peak stress, uh, peak aggravation, we're all very reactive. And, you know, to me, the key to my life having serenity and the key to me having 
integrity and pride is the ability to choose uh, the actions that I take. And before I learned about neurology, I don't feel like I had a big choice. I would respond to that text message before I thought. Mm -hmm. I would answer the phone before I was like, do I really want to take this call? Like I didn't have the ability to control my behavior and my reactions. Mm -hmm. And I would make decisions in, you know, with my head flooded with adrenaline or flooded with dopamine. You know, I look at a lot of let's just say bad relationships. And I look back and I'm like, I was just on drugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I look back and some of the decisions that I made under the influence of oxytocin mm -hmm. and it helps me forgive myself. It helps me have more patience for the bad decisions I've made, but it helps me as an adult go, you know what? I'm not gonna respond to this email till tomorrow when I'm not so adrenalized and activated. And to me, understanding the basics of neurology is the crux of living a serene life that you can be proud of. Now that's wonderful. I mean, the the culture around wellness has really grown a lot, which mm -hmm. I think is great. The culture and conversation around mindfulness has grown tremendously. We hear that term all the time. Yeah. For scientists, the term mindfulness is a little bit um, troubling because we always need to take the opposite. So mindfulness uh, is a great word. It sounds yeah. great, but the opposite of mindfulness would be mindlessness. Mm -hmm. Or and 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 I like to think about things. So. Philosophy and psychology tend to be more about nouns and adjectives. Mm -hmm. When you think about biology and neurology, it's more about verbs. It's what we, you would do because everything in biology is a process. So like, for instance, if you're- Sorry, take, it just took me yeah. a second. I was like, verb. Yeah, like verb action. So all <laughs> yeah, action yeah, yeah, words, right? So, words, yeah. so if we were to say, um, like you just gave a really nice example of how do you create that gap between stimulus and response? Mm -hmm. I mean, Viktor Frankl talked about the gap between stimulus and response. The people who are into mindfulness talk about the gap between stimulus and response. Like be um, responsive, not reactive. Yes. Be mindful. So to a scientist or biologist, we hear that and we go, well, how? How mm -hmm. does that actually work? Like, how would one actually do that? Because it mm -hmm. sounds wonderful, but then when you get a troubling text message, it's almost instantaneous and you find yourself actually in the behavior of responding. So how do you actually introduce the gap? So people have talked about, you know, transcendental meditation and all beautiful practices, but those take a very long time. Yes. So I think what my translation of what you just said, if I may, is that when one understands a little bit about their inner workings and the chemicals and the systems in the body that cause reactivity, I believe just that understanding of that knowledge can introduce the so-called gap or prevent you from being so reactive, mm -hmm. not you, but everybody, right. you included, right, right. from being so reactive without having to do anything except just understand that information. Mm. That the feeling in your body that you wanna move, that kind of like low level yes. um, agitation or jitter or text yes. or punch somebody or whatever it happens to be, that's adrenaline in action. Mm. Adrenaline's job was to move your body. So it means that anytime that you feel like you wanna do something, you may or may not be in the best position to do the right thing. Mm. So anytime that one feels the urgency to say something or do something, whether that's a text or to shout at somebody or to use if they were an addict or whatever it is. Put on your fucking mask. Exactly, there's a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a component there that I think everybody could benefit from understanding. That's adrenaline release into the body from this set of neurons in the middle of the spinal cord. And that takes half a second, wow. 500 milliseconds from when you find, get that information to where you feel like you're gonna move. And so th that tells you something, you're not gonna put that genie back in the bottle. Mm. You, what you need to do is learn how to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the calming axis of this nervous system and push back on that. Yeah. So my hope is that just even with some information, we can also talk about tools if you like, but just even with information, people will really be able to access the so-called gap, the, the the boundary between stimulus and response. The ability to pause. Absolutely, without, and if you have a meditation practice or if people do that, that's wonderful. And here's but, what I'll say, I, I'm a fan of meditation. I don't think most people have time to meditate. Well, and there's an additional problem with meditation too, and I'm gonna lose some friends by saying meditation this. Meditation turns into masturbation. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna say that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm guessing sometimes it probably does. Um, but meditation also, heightens one's awareness of their inner workings. And so the brain has two ways of functioning all the time. And it usually is doing both at the same time. One is called interoception, which just basically means paying attention to your internal real estate. Like uh -huh. what's going on inside? Am I breathing fast? Where's my heart rate at? Do I feel good? Am uh -huh. I happy? Am I sad? Basically everything within the confines of your skin. Okay. The other thing is called exteroception, which is perception of everything outside you. Mm -hmm. Now the nervous system is always measuring both to some degree or another. 
one might be more of our focus than the other. If we see something really dramatic, like if I go and I've, I've seen one of your shows before I met you, I went. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, that's right. I was at your New Year's Eve show, I think it was in Portland a few years back. And so I was fully in the experience of, I was in full exteroception, but when I would laugh, I'd feel something. So it's kind of going back and forth, interoception, mm. exteroception. Sounds when, exhausting. No, it was Sorry. actually a lot of fun. <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun. Um, the And we're doing it all the time, right? Except when we're in sleep and then we're fully in our, we're only in relation to what's going on inside us. What if sleep. you have night terrors like me? Uh, it's still only in re relation to what's going on inside you. So you're only interocepting. But when people meditate, you're increasing that interoceptive awareness. And for people that are anxious, mm -hmm. that may have social anxiety, to gain more awareness of how you're feeling inside mm -hmm. might actually be going in the wrong direction. Because mm. if somebody who has social anxiety goes to a party where they have speaking public speaking anxiety, mm. they don't want to be thinking about what they're feeling. They want to be out of their head, yeah. out of their body a little bit. Now, you don't want to be so out of your body that you're not in touch with your body. That's right. So there's a balance there. And I think certain forms of meditation actually have led to um, some uncomfortable states for people where they can't get out of their head because mm -hmm. they've spent hours sitting there thinking That's about right. their own thoughts. That's right. So I, I think there is a place for a meditative practice. I don't want the meditators to come after me, although I don't feel particularly threatened by a bunch of meditators <laughs> coming after me. <laughs> the idea of them kind out, of like wobbling in the lotus you position. With a, you know. with a pillow. I understand there's some very powerful humans out <laughs> there. throw that, some that beads could, at you. Yeah, exactly. That could hurt me that are meditators. And I, I do have a I'm meditation I'm pro-meditator. So do I. Right. I, love that, I love that we're worried about getting canceled by the meditators. Here, here's, I just, I believe that everyone's brain, everyone's childhood, everyone's ancestral trauma, everyone are different, you know? And I think for me, everyone meditating the same way at the same time with the same mantra is just a little silly. I think all our brains sort of need different things things, have different capabilities, have different bandwidths. I tried to do meditation the way that all the famous people talked about it for so long. It did not work for me. I got bored. I got antsy. I just was not at a place yet where I was ready to close my eyes uh, for 20 minutes. If I did reach any kind of relaxation, I would fall asleep. Uh, your brain sort of, I think, kind of does what it needs to do. Or I was too uncomfortable because too much pain would come up or emotions would come up or I was too addicted to my phone, whatever it is. But I did an attachment um, a class that works on your uh, attachment strategies with this guy, George Haas. And I, he gave me a mantra that I loved, which was, I forgive you, you forgive me, I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. It's a forgiveness meditation. Mm -hmm. It just worked for me. It helped me like release resentments. And I was able to kind of incorporate um, releasing resentments into my meditation. That's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really inconsistent about it. Um, I'm really imperfect about it. Sometimes it's better for me to just like do a moving meditation walking around the block. You know, like I just think that... Um, uh, I love what you're saying because a big part of 12-step programs is service, is taking the focus off yourself because we're so self-obsessed and we're such narcissists and me, 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 me. And we say your brain is a dangerous place or your mind is a dangerous place. Don't go in there alone. You know, so sometimes meditating is a way to just victimize yourself, obsess more about something, strengthen neural pathways that you should be weakening, frankly, and we should um, be doing service, which is like calling someone else and saying, how are you? What's going on with you, right? Because cooperation and productivity makes dopamine. So go do something else. Think about someone else. Take the focus off yourself for five minutes because we get so myopic when we just self-obsess. Yeah, if too much of our focus is in this interoception mode. It can be uncomfortable for mm -hmm. people. And so, and there are people who probably need to think about their thinking a little bit more mm -hmm. and probably certain people that want to think about it or ought to think about it less. Yeah. I mean, my lab has been very focused on respiration and breathing and not necessarily breath work mm -hmm. and not say sitting in a corner and huffing and puffing and breath holds and stuff, but really just using certain forms of respiration as a way to control the state of mind because it's immediate. You don't have to do any training in order mm -hmm. to do it. And it's very powerful for people to be able to shift from a state of higher activation and stress to a state of lower activation and mm -hmm. stress in real time. Right. You don't have to excuse yourself or take 20 minutes each morning with a timer. Right. So respiration and breath work, I think, is a very powerful entry point. to Because meditation uh, used to stress me out. I was like, I have to go meditate. I have to go. And I'm like, right. the stress that it's causing me to carve out time to meditate mm -hmm. is probably canceling out the meditation right. at this point. And there is a question as to whether or not a lot of the benefits of meditation are because of the slowed breathing and the breathing alone. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can explain all the positive effects of meditation through the, re the changes in breathing that mm -hmm. happen in meditation. But you mentioned walking meditation. Yeah. So walking meditation is a beautiful example of where you're interocepting, you're thinking about your experience, but that you have to have a certain amount of exteroception. Mm -hmm. You know, all animals, I know you have a deep appreciation for animals, use self-motion, what we call self-generated optic flow, seeing things pass by their eyes Ooh. as a way to calm the nervous system. Right. And that's because when the body is moving, 
and there are images flowing by on the retinas or for blind people out there, um, auditory scenes, so to speak, are flowing by. It actually has a direct calming effect on the fear center of the brain, this threat detection center, the amygdala. This has now been demonstrated in imaging studies that, and this is the basis of EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, where the eyes are moving from side to side. That actually is the eye movement that is caused by forward ambulation, by walking or by biking or by running, mm. or even for someone in a wheelchair, if they're in a wheelchair, as long as it's self-generated optic flow, so moving forward and seeing things pass by your eyes in space, you're quieting the fear centers of the mind. And so that's very different than sitting in the lotus position. And I don't want to knock on meditation too yeah, much, yeah, yeah. but sometimes just getting into forward motion uh -huh. is one of the best remedies for stress. And it's an ancient one that all animals use, all animals with eyes anyway, and that can walk. They they know intuitively that when they're stressed, they do things like shake off that stress. I think mm. there's a name for that, although it escapes me at the moment. And they walk, self-generated. So if anyone's feeling excessive stress, yes, you can meditate, but that will put you into more of an interoceptive mode, thinking about what's going on inside you. There's great benefit to just going for a walk, mm -hmm. not looking at your phone during that walk because yeah. then you don't get the optic flow or a run or cycling. It's so basic, mm -hmm. but it has a basis in neurology. It actually quiets these threat detection centers in the brain. So steal someone's wheelchair is the main takeaway from this. <laughs> steal your grandma's People do wheelchair. that in airports every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. I see them wheel up to the thing and then pop up and then start walking out. Does dr yeah. a drive do that? Going for a drive or being- Or a motorcycle ride or- uh, uh, Self motion helps. Mm -hmm. So when you're driving, you're not doing much generally except um, mm -hmm. you know, steering the wheel. So it would be best to do this through some sort of physical activity. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be very vigorous, although mm -hmm. it could. But the key thing is self-generated optic flow. So that means being in bodily motion with images passing by you on the retina. This is on the retina, which is just the seeing portion of the eye, excuse me. And this is what a treadmill in a gym won't ah, do. Ah, interesting. Right? And Pelotons and those kinds of things where you're looking at images of things passing by sort of mimic it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are ancient forms of but our We're also biology. looking at a screen, which is a light, right? Right. And you're, you're focusing your eyes into a narrow channel, which actually raises stress levels. Mm -hmm. Anytime your eyes are focused in a small compartment of space. Right whether or not it's a phone or a tablet or, or a smaller room as opposed to a big vista, you are increasing the level of alertness in your brainstem through a mechanism that links the eyes and the brainstem, which is the back of the brain. If you're looking at a horizon or right. a panorama, you're naturally disengaging that and you'll err more towards calm. And is the biological basis for that, the idea of if you're seeing sort of in a panoramic way, you're able to look for threats, you're able to see everything around you, like it makes sense, right? Yeah, when you're, you're hunched calmer. over looking at a small thing, isn't the hunched over position part of the reason that being on the phone stresses us out so much is when you hunch over, that is a, a defensive position that historically um, we would be hiding, we would be being attacked and our body sort of automatically yeah, goes so it, into fight or flight. It, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you Please off. Please do. Yeah. Someone's um, got to. It's, uh, you're absolutely right. So there are these defensive postures that all animals, including humans, occupy. Typically, it's going to be spinal flexion. So, mm -hmm. you know, sort of think ab crunch as opposed to spinal extension, which is um, more relaxed, mm -hmm. right? The, there's a fundamental question in neuroscience that my lab and other labs are trying to resolve, which is to what extent is this stuff bidirectional? So we know that- What's bidirectional mean? It means, um, it means we know the stress response controls certain behaviors. So let's say the stress response hits. My pupils or your pupils will dilate, uh -huh. which makes us see the world in portrait mode. Like, right. Like, like, like on portrait mode of the phone. Ooh. One thing, the thing that we're I paying attention to- I look good in portrait to, mode. <laughs> it's my favorite. You like portrait yeah, mode? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's a photographer with portrait mode now. Well, in portrait mode or when the, there's a certain amount of adrenaline in your system, the thing that you're looking at looks very clear and everything else looks kind of blurry. Right. The, 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 everything else fades away. And this is I, tunnel vision. And a tunnel vision, which I, I just want to like really dumb things down, not because people are dumb, because I'm dumb and I just like to really say things like five different ways or five different examples sometimes. Um, but like if you're dating someone and they come at you, what the fuck was this text? The, it feels like the only thing in the world, mm -hmm. right? It just sort and of like that and narrowing. Is. And it is the visual system. So um, the back of your eye are these three layers of cells called the neural retina. They're actually a piece of your brain that was pushed out of your brain during development. They're not attached to your brain. Your eyes are actually pieces of your brain. They're the only piece of your brain pushed out of the brain uh, during development, out of the skull, excuse me, uh, away from the rest of the brain. And when you stress, the pupils dilate and you see whatever it is that's stressing you out, the text message, the person, whatever it is, mm -hmm. 
in sharper, clearer focus than everything else. Yeah. Another thing happens, which is your internal, there's like a metronome that's counting time. Metronome to, is those little thing that goes. Dick, oh yeah, dick, excuse dick, me. Dick, so dick, it's like tick, 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 tick. I'm going to subtitle everything. You so everything outside you will seem like it's moving more slowly when you're stressed. Yeah. And your internal world will feel like it's going a million miles an hour. Yeah. So if you've ever been in line at the airport and you're late and it, you're, it feels really stressful. The person in front of you feel it feels like you're taking forever. It looks, it feels like things are in slow motion. You feel like you're in quicksand or like trying to walk through mud or something when you're stressed right. out. Right. If you ever been in an appointment and you know you need to leave for another appointment and you're trying to pay attention, two it, minutes feels like two hours. Exactly. So the other thing that happens is this hunching posture. The other thing is a quickening of the breathing and the heart rate. So there are a bunch of things that happen in the stress response. When I said there, there there's a big question right now as to whether or not it's bi directional. What I mean is, it's unclear still whether or not changing the way that I view the world, changing my posture will calm me. Now, yeah. in general, the results point to an answer that is yes, that indeed, if I'm stressed for, let's say you say something that stresses me out, yes. I'll get more narrow focus on you and the channel of information that's passing between us. But if I take my vision and I go into what's called panoramic vision, where I'm just looking at you, but now I'm seeing the ceiling and the floor and you and everything all at once, that tends to calm me down, mm -hmm. tends to calm people down. It's not just me. Right. In general, when we release that spinal flexion and going more into spinal extension. Which it, means just putting your shoulders back. That's right. Si sitting up straight. It does. I th it has a calming effect largely because it releases some of the musculature of the throat that allows you to speak more clearly. Right. Voice and intonation is a very, very powerful readout of the stress response. And isn't this, am I gonna, is saying this wrong, the vagal, vagal nerve? Vagal. So the vagus nerve vagus. is a is a set of connections that originate in the brainstem and neck area, the parasympathetic, so mm -hmm. it originates here, that extends almost everywhere through the body. Right. The word vagus actually uh, is related to the word vagabond. It means wandering Whoa. Be because the anatomist saw just how extensive this connection is. And this is the connection to the body that stimulates the kind of relaxation, so-called rest and digest response. The best way to trigger activation of the vagus unfortunately is eating because <laughs> when the stomach is distended, it sends a signal that you have enough resources and it's time to relax. Ooh. But there's a is fast- Is that why we eat when we're anxious? Yes. Or nervous? So the most ancient and well-developed and still very present today form of stress relief is ingestion of foods that fill us up mm -hmm. or that trigger the activation of serotonin, so carbohydrates, right. right? Carbohydrates are the best known cortisol suppressor, Ooh. right? So this is why people drink alcohol, they eat carbohydrates, they fill their belly, they eat to calm themselves. But that response is actually very slow. The, the fastest way that I'm aware of to calm the nervous system when one is stressed is to use respiration, breathing, but to use a different connection that runs down the other side of the neck, mm -hmm. which is called the phrenic nerve, mm -hmm. P-H-R-E-N-I-C. Unnecessarily complicated. Unnecessarily complicated. <laughs> But if you want to look it up and you're, and you're using an F, you're doing yeah. it wrong. It's PH. Why? It so that's the only reason I spell, spell it Spell it with out. an F. Like, it's just why. It's a really interesting nerve connection because, first of all, it's a very fast pathway. The vagus is slow. Yeah. The vagus is like is like walking on the shoulder of the freeway. The the if To get someplace, that's going to be slow, whereas the phrenic nerve is a very fast pathway. Right, it's but like that's the, breathing. That's the fast lane, and that's breathing. And there's one pattern of breathing in particular that all animals use. I'll reference animals as many times Thank as I you. can because I, I adore animals <laughs> and animal behavior as well, which is the physiological sigh. So you you literally have a set of 200 neurons, and it's not 100 and it's not 1,000, 200 neurons in your brainstem that control a particular pattern of breathing that you do anytime oxygen in the environment is low mm -hmm. or this thing called carbon dioxide, which makes us want to breathe and stresses us out, right. gets too high. And that pattern of breathing is two inhales. And But let we, me ask you something. I'm really going to get granular yeah. on this. I've been told that I breathe wrong. I've been told I breathe from my chest and not my stomach. Okay. What, where is the oxygen coming from exactly when you do those inhales? Okay. So let's talk, uh, we'll just discuss the neural circuits and anatomy of breathing for two minutes. <laughs> In a two-minute thing with no acronyms. I've been told, okay. at 37 years old, I was told the other day by a trainer that I don't know how to run, that I run wrong, mm. and I was told that I breathe wrong. But it's a lot of it is performers, we have to hold our breath for a real long time, and then we let it go. So I can hold my breath for way too long. Right, and opera singers are spectacular at the controlling the system as well. So, all right, so the neuroanatomy and anatomy of breathing in two minutes or less. <laughs> go. You have two centers in your brain. 
One controls rhythm, rhythmic breathing. Uh-huh. Rhythmic means inhale follows exhale, follows inhale, follows exhale, just like day follows night. Mm-hmm. This area, if you want to remember it, <laughs> it's called the Prebotzinger complex. But the best way we remember it is it was named after a bottle of wine by a very prominent and important breathing researcher at UCLA named Jack Feldman. Anytime you're breathing, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, you're using the, let's call it the, the wine center of the brain, just for fun. <laughs> the wine right. center? The, I have a couple the of other those. breathing center is it's called the parafacial nucleus. That doesn't matter. But the reason it's called parafacial <laughs> is it's it's an area f- that controls breathing that violates inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, allows you to inhale twice, exhale twice, yeah. inhale three times. The reason you have this area in your brain and everyone has this area in their brain is because you need to coordinate breathing with speaking. So uh, when you're on, the example you just gave is perfect. When you're on stage and you're you're about, I don't know, you're making a sprint towards a, a <laughs> what, what do you call it? A punchline? I'm out of my wheelhouse. No. It's like a, what is it? When you're like. Our, our you're, terms are way more simple than right. yours. Yeah, okay. a joke, a setup, a punchline. A punch joke, a, what, a joke? What's a joke? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's I've four, heard of these jokes. Things. You guys should take a hint from comedians. So there's a Latin name. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. The, um, <laughs> so the you have this brain center that controls non-rhythmic breathing. They both control a a really important muscle in your belly called the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And the important thing to understand about the diaphragm is it's skeletal muscle. So just like a bicep or tricep or quadricep, this organ we call the diaphragm was designed to be moved voluntarily or involuntarily, which is very different than your heart or your spleen or your liver. Which we have no control. You have no direct control over. So there's a particular pattern of breathing, which is two inhales followed by a longer exhale, Mm -hmm. maybe repeated two or three times, that triggers activation of the phrenic nerve to diaphragm, and it causes your lungs to bring in oxygen, and it reinflates these little sacs in the lungs called the alveoli, and I'm running through this very fast, but what it does is it balances the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in your bloodstream and lungs, and basically what it does is it makes you go from too anxious to calm. So if anyone wants to try this, it's two inhales and it's not the same as taking one deep breath or doing one long exhale. I'm in traffic. I'm late for my flight. I just read a crazy piece of news that school's not coming back in. I just saw a speech from Fauci. Like I just saw someone in a mask or not in a mask or whatever. And I feel myself getting activated. I feel, you know, when you feel the tingly in your Mm -hmm. chest and start sweating or you feel that sort Mm -hmm. of bout of rage. It's starting. Come over you. Right. A or tool it started. you can use. So you inhale through your nose once, then you inhale again at the top. But is my is my is this? We'll supposed, talk about that. Is in my a chest? <laughs> well, when you're talking, it's impossible. <laughs> is my chest supposed to go up the way it just did, or is my belly supposed to go out? Did I, you do all that on I a single know. inhale? I don't That's know. amazing. What do you mean? No, you haven't exhaled yet. No, so, so it's too, I don't exhale. Let's try. Again. I never do. I I get no oxygen in my body. Right. The woman said to me, she goes, you are not using even 10% of your life force. So these are the, okay. Well, I'm not, not going to counter someone else's um, assessment. <laughs> no, this was like a okay. healer that so, like I paid by check in Venice. So unless Whitney cracks a joke right in the middle, <laughs> what you want to do is inhale through your nose, then inhale again at the top, a little bit more, then exhale. To my nose exhale, either one. <laughs> So ideally, it's nose, nose, mouth, and then mouth. Longer breathe, longer <laughs> exhale. <laughs> Eye contact makes me nervous, so it's making me more stressed out that you're looking at me. <laughs> okay, I won't look at you. Okay. Okay, wait. Two inhales. It's warm today too. So, and then long exhale. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Why is it? What am I broken? Uh, no. I have um, a disaster. No, not at all. Tell me. That pattern of breathing is what animals do right before they lie down for a nap. I feel dizzy. You do it. Do you really? When I take a deep breath, I start, I feel high. Do a shallower breath on the first one. Don't breathe in so deeply on the first one. Hold on. So go. Wait. Inhale. (laughs) Okay, hold on. Ready. Inhale. (laughs) (laughs) Was that shitty? (laughs) No, No, you're dragging me up. Just through my nose. Inhale through your nose. Inhale again at the top. And then... But more like I have coffee breath. So oh yeah. I, okay. Okay. So I'm gonna du- drown. This right double now. inhale, long exhale pattern of breathing is important because it's mother nature. Perfect. Is that Lamaze? Is that what Lamaze it's is? It's much. It's similar to Lamaze. But people who aren't pregnant or or and men who, as far as I know, still maybe there have been some men. Who I'm got probably pregnant. pregnant. Yeah, I don't know. That, that um, anyone can do this, and it's. It's nature's natural way, nature's natural, it's nature's hardwired way of letting the nervous system, these neurons in the parafacial nucleus, control the phrenic nerve, control the diaphragm, control the lungs, control oxygen to carbon dioxide ratios. Which translates to calm the fuck down. Exactly. 
So it's very important that people have this tool in my belief, because it doesn't require any breath work or training. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take a class. It's, it's available to you at all times, I suppose, unless you're underwater or something like that. Now, it's not terribly covert. Like mm -hmm. if we're in an argument and suddenly I start hearing, you know, double inhale, long exhales. <laughs> right. I know you're doing it. There's an additional tool. <laughs> That's so that, passive aggressive. Right. If someone you're dating right. starts to fight with you and you're just like. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sigh. I mean, I guess eye roll yeah. optional. You know, the, <laughs> if you don't um, eye roll, because that's fucking. Rude. That's right. I'm not aware that. The, oh, you're doing the, that thing, or you do your breathing exactly. thing. <laughs> I mean, a number of important arguments have been won or lost on the basis of the inclusion of the eye roll. That's <laughs> yeah, a, I was that's say, a non peer review. Not about study. doing it; it's about that's how right. you do it. And you're that's not allowed right. to roll your eyes. <sighs> okay. Taking a little break from neuroscience <laughs> now. Huh. A word from our sponsor. <laughs> How gross is that? Taking a little break from me being a crazy person around a neuroscientist <laughs> um, to talk about Magic Spoon. I'm getting worried that Magic Spoon is the only thing I eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's truly the only thing you eat. I am obsessed with Magic Spoon, dude. It is because I, I grew up on cereal. I used to eat. Remember, um, Apple Jacks. Oh yeah, I, I do. used to mix Apple Jacks and Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and that's all. I like cereal. I just live for cereal. I love cereal too, and I love. But I most love, cereal is really bad for you. Oh, yeah, I love Magic Spoon <laughs> because it lets you eat like a child. That's but it, right. <laughs> but it also allows me to work on you know not being shit like a baby. Zero sugar, literally zero sugar. Twelve grams of protein, three net grams of carbs in each serving. I eat this after dinner. I mean, I and eat like the, a dessert. That's I what I do. <laughs> I eat it for dessert at like 11 o'clock at night. You don't feel guilty. You don't feel gross. You don't feel like it, you don't you get just feel full. No, like shame spiral. Um, my favorite are the fruities. Oh, that's a little chill on the nose for me. So I like the frosted ones. Are you calling me unoriginal with my cereal choice? You no, know, it's calling me gay. <laughs> <laughs> the cocoa are good too. Sometimes I'll do the cocoa with chocolate yeah. almond milk, and it is so decadent. Taste amazing. I, I, gluten free. The blueberry free. ones are good too. Don't give. Don't leave them out. I don't they're really sleep good. On the I like the frosted too, but the fruities definitely. I'm a big my fan favorite. of blueberry, which only comes out on Halloween, <laughs> and that is a good keto substitute. friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, GMO free. Benton, did you just lose twenty pounds? I did. Do you think Magic Spoon? I mean, it definitely has been an instrumental part of your weight loss journey. Yes, because I hate eating breakfast. This is not even a joke. I hate eating breakfast. <laughs> Everything else. <laughs> also, there's not a camera looking at me. But also, um, I don't like eating breakfast. Yeah. And this is so easy to eat, and it feels like I'm eating a treat. So okay. I mean, it did help. <laughs> <laughs> Magic Spoon, you guys know I'm obsessed with Magic Spoon. Magicspoon.com slash Whitney. Grab a variety pack. Try it today. Make sure to use your promo code Whitney to get free shipping. Magicspoon.com slash Whitney to grab a variety pack. Try it today. Be sure to use our promo code Whitney at checkout. That's my name to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. That's a power move, Benton. That's a move. That's a move. That is a power move. MagicSpoon.com slash Whitney. Use the promo code Whitney for free and free <laughs> shipping. <laughs> Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring the podcast. Can you explain to me and our fans what Italic is? Yes, Italic is a membership that grants access to over 800 plus quality goods. Maybe you the same manufacturers. You, you get a lot of really fancy stuff, <laughs> but no middleman. You, yes. you can look like you're, you can dress like a celebrity for the price of, <laughs> you know, one someone who's not. Right. Well, here's the thing. All these expensive brands, you're basically paying for them to like hire models for their ad campaign and put crazy brands on it. They just mark up. And then you're wearing them around. Like, I don't want to be a billboard. I don't want to advertise for some... I was going to name an actual brand, but I don't know <laughs> yeah, if I'm I did too. I did. For some man that makes shoes that hardly even fit. Like, why is it my responsibility to advertise your product after I've You're already bought it? Yep. Yes! Just because I'm shaped like a billboard doesn't mean I want to be one. <laughs> But Italic doesn't do that. You can just you can cut out the middleman. Luxury handbags, cashmere sweaters, activewear, bedding, bath towels. I need some of those. Cookware. Cookware. Don't need some of those. You definitely need that. And even diamond jewelry. So if you want to propose to me, maybe on a I, budget. On a, <laughs> italic is the place. So when I have to buy my engagement <laughs> ring for myself, um, from the best possible manufacturers in each category. Be smart. Don't pay a thousand dollars for a logo. That's ridiculous. It's rigmarole. Don't be a sheeple. 
save your money for more important things like my merch. Like 90 the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> 93 percent of new members are breaking even on their first purchase wow saving an average of 746 dollars per year with their membership i mean think of all the things you could buy for 746 dollars one one new tooth <laughs> that's 746 things from the dollar store <laughs> yeah <laughs> you could be that's getting. a good one <laughs> 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 There's currently a wait list to join Italic. Whoa! But they're offering my listeners to skip the wait and join immediately when you sign up through this link. Italic, I-T-A-L-I-C dot com slash Whitney. Sign up for the membership now. Get access to Italic's high quality, beautifully designed products to improve your closet, home, kitchen, and more. Don't pay for those silly goose markups again. The other thing is this panoramic vision thing. So if somebody has an issue with public speaking or they're being, or they're trying to take in information, they're feeling stressed or whatever it is, whatever the cause of stress is, this panoramic vision thing is powerful because it releases the stress system to the point where you can see space more. You see more of the environment that you're in. But what's really important is that to understand is that when one is in the stress response, remember that internal metronome starts going tick, 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 and everything outside you seems like it's going really slowly. Mm -hmm. When you go into panoramic vision, which is not looking around all over the place, it just means keeping your head and eyes still. But right now I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna dial out my gaze so that I can still see you, but I can see the ceiling and the floor. I can see myself in the environment that I'm in. Is it, is That's it the opposite, very calming. Is it opposite of sort of the um, idea of like being cornered? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like when if 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 I attack you and go, what the fuck was that? Let's say, and you're here. If you want panoramic vision, does that mean walking outside, leaving the room, changing your position in the room? So ideally, you would view a horizon outside. Okay. When you go to the beach, you just naturally do this. When you see a, a vista, you're hiking. You naturally it's go. Part of the reason why vision. sunsets and beaches are probably more relaxing. A ultimately, big, big part of that. But if you're indoors, you can also do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've tested this in a VR format, claustrophobia, et cetera, but I won't, I won't go into the studies in detail. But you can do this in any environment, even on an airplane or in a car if you're claustrophobic. If you combine this with the sigh, the double inhale, exhale, mm -hmm. it just uh, then it's going to have even more of a positive effect in terms of calming. The other thing that's interesting about this panoramic vision is that animals that are very placid, mm -hmm. Now, I know horses can be very aggressive, but I know you know a lot more about horses than I ever will. But um, but grazing animals, mm -hmm. cows, sheep, horses, they only see the world in panorama. Right. And what's interesting is if if a member of one of their species is, you know, injured or hurt, uh, you know, you see these gazelles when they get attacked by a lion. You see these things on YouTube or nature mm -hmm. specials. Five minutes later, the rest of them are just like grazing around. Mm -hmm. That we would be traumatized, yeah. right? If suddenly, you know, one of us was killed, we, that location would forever hold a feeling of trauma and trouble. They are so placid all the time that they actually have a hard time staying in the stress response. Right. Now, horses might be different, and, and we could talk about that because horses can actually move their eyes forward mm -hmm. when they enter the stress response. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that when you're in panoramic vision, so you're dialing out your gaze, so to mm -hmm. speak. You are not only calming yourself internally at the level of the brainstem, but you also start to measure time differently. You right. feel like you have more time. Right, right. So almost all reactive states are states in which we feel like we have to respond and time is moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that internal metronome. Got that text. Going, you got that email. Exactly. I got to respond. I got to respond. Most incarcerations, bad decisions, things we wish we didn't mm. say, the, imp the impulsivity yes. is caused by feeling that time pressured right. and space pressured being right. cornered is, is I love that example. Cause that yeah, did. I think I'm just trying to right. put it in the terms we understand of like, if I'm in a situation where, um, you know, I'm uh, an altercation is possible. I want to be able to just have the tools to say, you know, and we talk about this a lot on the podcast is like what happens in that second between getting stimulated, getting activated and taking an action That's and right. how a lot of us are addicted to taking an action and being reactive. And then w sending one email can fuck up your whole month, right. sending one email before you were ready, saying one thing that you shouldn't have fucking said. Right. Um, you know, I'm obsessed. In, you know, we say in in 12 step programs, don't just do something, sit there. How do you just fucking sit there and do nothing as long as possible? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's we sit around and talk about doing something, doing something, but doing nothing is way right. <laughs> harder. You know, one of my favorite quotes is um, sometimes the best battle strategy is a masterful retreat. But how do you do it right. and how do you get that self-control? And this is what you're such a genius um, in your work about. But in a in an altercation or possible altercation, the tools are being saying of, of being saying that's nothing that's latin you probably don't understand it it's too advanced for you um but being able to say to someone you know what i need to take a walk i'm feeling cornered mm -hmm. 
You know, just th- being able to say that, going for a walk, getting your panoramic vision activated, mm-hmm. taking those deep breaths, like that can truly change your life. I mean, to me, that is the difference between, you know, fucking up a marriage, fucking up a relationship, you know, f- forever scarring a family member, saying something mm-hmm. you don't mean, saying it mean, whatever. Mm-hmm. Or nowadays, you know, saying the wrong thing on the street, someone triggers you, you say Tweeting something. the wrong phones thing. Phones are out and like, there goes your professional life. That's or, right, you know, because someone's recording because right. you lost your shit in Trader Joe's because you couldn't take these three fucking deep breaths. Right, there are exceptions to what I'm about to say, but um, what was taught to me a long time ago um, by my graduate advisor, who was a very thoughtful, extremely smart and very deliberate person was, mm-hmm. You rarely get in trouble for what you don't say. And there are times when we need to speak up, obviously, but that ability so to introduce the gap mm-hmm. in, between stimulus and response, mm-hmm. in my belief, and as a big motivation of my work, is that that shouldn't require a decade of meditative training. It shouldn't require no one has that extensive, kind of time. Yeah. extensive training. H- and HR will have written me up by that. <laughs> like I need, I would like to figure out the way to give people tools right now of how to not take the bait the next time your boyfriend calls you a bitch or your mom rolls her eyes at you. Like, what, like how do you not take the bait mm-hmm. is another well, the, way to put it. Well, those two tools will help people calm quickly. They're the fastest tools that I'm aware of. They don't require a lot of training or anything. You were born with these neurons. Everyone has these neurons. Think of them like levers and buttons that were installed in you and you didn't know because mm-hmm. you mainly do the sighing and sleep. Yeah. And you, claustrophobics do it in claustrophobic environments. But the important thing to understand is that other animals – more intuitive than us do mm-hmm. this. They yeah. know to do this. They do these sighs when they get stressed. They know to look at, try and get into panoramic vision or into self-generated optic flow yeah. to calm their amygdala. They don't know what an amygdala is. They don't right. care, but they know to do this stuff intuitively. Humans are amazing because we have two things that make us special, which are a forebrain that allows us to make plans Yeah. in light of what we know about the past and what we think might happen in the future. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing capacity. Yep. My dog might make plans, but if he does, he doesn't re- implement them, at least not over a long time <laughs> scale, right? He's just, I mean, he might have brilliant ideas, but he doesn't implement them. It's funny because you know? it's, I think a big part of what I love so much about dogs is my dogs are always so, so psyched to see me, even though they saw me two minutes ago. Right. And I'm always like, they have no concept of time. Right. They're living in the moment, which is beautiful, but they also yeah. don't develop any technologies, yeah. which is, uh, you know, but we do. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change in response to experience. But if you think about it, both that ability to make plans in light of what we know from the past and neuroplasticity, it truly is a double-edged sword because on the one hand, we have amazing technologies, planes and iPhones and incredible Mm -hmm. things. Neuroplasticity can allow us to learn new things, unlearn things, Mm -hmm. develop new relationships to people, places and things. But neuroplasticity is also the basis of trauma. And neuroplasticity is is essentially for someone like myself who's still trying to understand it. It basically is the conceit that the brain can change. It can evolve. You can make new neural pathways. That's right. There are a couple ways that the brain can change itself. Uh, It can add new neurons. That actually can happen. It's a little less common than the other forms of neuroplasticity, but you can lose connections, which sounds terrible, but actually a lot of learning is the removal of connections. Unlearning. So so a baby that's flopping around like Mm -hmm. a little potato bug or Mm -hmm. whatever, you can tell I don't have children. (laughs) Um, You know, then, you know, a year later you go back and you see, and this kid is walking and talking. Wait, what's a potato bug? Those things that just like curl up or like- A roly poly? Yeah, those things. Is that what you call them? Yeah, I guess. A a millipede? No, I think it's a roly poly. Yeah, like babies are kind of like that. Oh, is potato Bug, is that, what, yeah, is that I mean, babies it? are wonderful, but they're they're kind of. What do you all... call a box with juice in it, with a straw? Juice box. Really? I call them a sip up. I East love co- it when... East Coast, West Coast. <laughs> yes, I wait, love. Wait, wait. So, <laughs> so soda or? I say Coke for everything. Oh, I thought you say pop. Yeah, no, no, like no, 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 no. Kids, that's like a Midwestern were... thing. Oh, that's a Midwestern. You say Coke about everything: Fresca, Sprite, okay. Diet Right, Dr Pepper, a Pepper, a Dr Pepper. Okay. We fucked with Dr Pepper. Where I'm from. Okay. But yeah, Roly Poly is one of the I think dividing factors in American linguistics. A potato bug versus a roly poly, a juice box versus a sip up. Oh, I've never heard of What do you sip call up. a thing that's like a little uh you draw with it as a kid and it's a, a bunch sketch. of colors? That's just good. It's a thing that crayons. Crowns. See, we call them crowns or crowns are what you wear on <laughs> like your a head. crown. Yeah, that's what we call it. Crayon. Cement or cement? Some <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I heard something different there for a second. Sorry. That was fast. Did you say semen or cum? Okay, so I'm gonna get your few fire. Um, <laughs> I'm a biologist, so we use a different word entirely. Um, 
I'm not going to go down. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not, this I is may, called the gap between. You just saw it happen. You just right. saw pause. That's right. You just saw non reactivity. So I'm going to do a inhale. <laughs> yeah, so, do you need to go look at a sunset yeah, real quick? I know, I know. Um, where was I? Everywhere. Okay. So a baby doesn't mm-hmm. do much. Their motor patterns are really uncoordinated. They don't do much. Yeah. In the course of the first year or two, they go to very deliberate motor control and behaviors. They start speaking, et cetera. That's mainly due to loss of connections, believe it or not, pruning away of connections. Mm. So I, a lot of people think that neuroplasticity is all about new connections. It's also loss of connections. Right. An addict who is absolutely compelled in every way to use cocaine, mm-hmm. who gets clean yeah. and stays clean. Yeah likely removes as many neural connections that represent cocaine and its relationship to the dopamine pathway. So can I just say real quick, part of the reason why when you hear rehabs are 30 days, right? 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and these sort of feel arbitrary in some way, but isn't it 28 to 30 days to make a new neural pathway or sort of atrophy an old one? Um, The more intense an experience, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately the more negative experience is, the more quickly neuroplasticity is engaged. Mm. There is something called one trial learning. Right. You touch a hot stove once, it hurts. I got it. You don't do Loud it again. And, and that's because mother nature wired us. Mm-hmm. You know, the brain and nervous system are wired to keep us safe first. Before it wants allows us to be happy, yes. actualized, whatever the verbiage is. Yeah. We're not designed to, sure. to be living in bliss. We're designed to just survive. <laughs> that's right. We have a natural fear of heights, for instance, of depth babies will develop that very early without any training. Mm -hmm. Most everything else has to be learned. Most everything else. I know you're very interested in this topic, so so we can go down. But but just to kind of put a little bit of a bow, although we won't, um, since I don't know how to tie a proper bow wrap a present. (laughs) Anyway, I won't tie it well, so we can leave it kind of partially open. But the, the point is that neuroplasticity is the ability for your nervous system and brain to change in response to experience. I, I say nervous system because I want people to really understand that it's not just what's going on in the skull. It's also the, these eyes, the visual, the brain that's outside the skull, as well as in the spinal cord, there's neuroplasticity all over the gut brain. Mm -hmm. There's plasticity there. Two kinds of plasticity generally maladaptive, like after a brain injury and adaptive. If we talk about plasticity, we'll probably be talking about adaptive plasticity. And then there's child plasticity, which is everything up until about, about age 25. Right. And that happens very quickly, Mm -hmm. very easily. Well, that's just learning, right? Learning. Is that learning? But I feel like after 25, it turns into plasticity. I'm an expert on this because it's, I, I, you know, kids learn, they absorb everything really easily. It's harder once you turn 25. Sure. Well, it's a little bit semantic, but since you're interested in this and I'm guessing some of your audience is, um, two guys, turns out it was guys, David Hubel and Torrance and Weasel, Mm -hmm. who incidentally were my scientific- Torrance and Weasel? He's still alive, 92 years old, still runs miles a day, sharp of mind and an incredible human. Wow, Um, I I am biased. They're my scientific great-grandparents. They won the Nobel Prize with a guy here at um, Caltech named Roger Sperry for their work illustrating critical periods, which are periods from birth Mm. until about age 25 in humans when the brain is very plastic. Right. So we do call that neural plasticity, but we call it developmental plasticity. Like, Uh, I feel like you don't get points for it. That's that's where I'm going. uh, Well, it's the basis of fire together, wire together, which was, if you've ever heard fire together, wire together, you just do something again and again, Mm -hmm. and your brain is reshaped Right. in accordance to that behavior. It's like learning a language when you're right. 15 versus learning a language right. when you're 40. And since I'm a scientist, we have to properly credit people. A lot of people think that uh, someone on Instagram or in the wellness space developed Fire Together, Wire Together. They did not. Fire Together, Wire Together is the words and important discovery of my colleague, Carla Schatz, who's at, at uh, Stanford, who um, is a remarkable scientist. She was David and Tordston's graduate student. Mm-hmm. And she was the one who really made the key discovery showing that repeating a behavior or exposure to a particular environment during development makes the brain a map of that experience. Now this, for better or for worse. For better or for worse. Then starting at about age 25, you get what's called adult plasticity, which does not- well, You're trying to undo all the shit from your childhood. <laughs> well, neuroplasticity is kind of the great promise of neuroscience to undo traumas. That's right. And for a long time, people thought that ne- adult plasticity wasn't possible. But a guy came along, his name is Mike Merzenich, and he really pushed this hard. He said, look, if 
something is intense enough or you focus on it mm. enough, or if you get the right combination of chemicals released in the brain, in particular mm. dopamine and acetylcholine, and we can talk about these if you like in detail, then adult neuroplasticity is possible. And the experiments that he and his graduate students and postdocs did, and now many hundreds of labs have done, have essentially proven that adult plasticity is possible. You can learn new things as an adult. You mm -hmm. can unlearn things. You can, people can get sober, they can get over traumas. The ways to do this are many we can talk about, but they're all grounded in a certain set of principles. You have to be alert for mm -hmm. the learning. You have to be focused on which exactly is, what you're trying to learn. Which is, I think this is something that was um, so profound. Unfortunately, this was profound to me um, listening to you on Rogan because it was like, I'll read through self-help books. I'll go to the gym, but I'm ha I am half-assing it. We are all half kind of focused on our phone. We're kind of texting at the same time. It is very rare that I'm just doing one thing 100 percent. And then I'm annoyed I don't get the results I want. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that we sort of it's kind of an epidemic how um, uh, our attention is so um, divided. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't even realize it. It's become the new normal. We not only can we multitask, but we were designed to multitask. Mm -hmm. There's a, we can do what's called covert attention, which is you can talk to me and pay attention to something that's going on in the corner of the room at the same time. You can split your attention into- But then I might send an email to the wrong person by accident right. about the person. Or you can bring both spheres of attention to one location. Mm -hmm. You can interocept. You can pay attention to, for instance, to how quickly you might be breathing at this moment while paying attention to what I'm saying, mm -hmm. or you can bring 100% of your attention to your breathing or 100% of attention to what I'm saying. Right. You can do this in a very dynamic way. What Merzenich and colleagues have shown is that if you want to trigger neuroplasticity, you want to learn something, you want to unlearn something, you want to bring the maximum amount of mental focus to whatever it is that you're trying to change, and that feels you like effort. You have to effort. take Adderall. That's, <laughs> well, that's actually what Adderall does. <laughs> It's a stimulant and it triggers the release of the neurochemical norepinephrine or in some cases epinephrine that trigger alertness. Acetylcholine is like a spotlight. Mm -hmm. And then the key thing is that the actual plasticity, the actual rewiring of the connections does not occur during the learning. It occurs during sleep and deep rest. Ooh. So this is where knowing how to calm oneself down, not just to sleep better, although sleep is one component. But I, can I just put it in layman's terms? Sure. Like I will, if I'm like trying to study jokes to memorize, like I'm trying to figure out a time when I can go out and do stand up, and I had to like literally go back and like rememorize the jokes I was doing before the pandemic and I can't get it and I can't, I'm trying to do it. And then I go to sleep and I wake up and I have it mm -hmm. lock and step, totally memorized. And that's because during sleep, is when the connections between neurons are changing. So sometimes the best thing you can do if you're in an eight hour work day and you've been working on something or trying to memorize it, or the best thing you can do is just go to sleep. That's right. And if you're not gonna sleep, go into a state of deep relaxation of some kind, mm -hmm. just lie there. I'm a big fan of this um, process, yoga nidra, mm -hmm. which is what actually means yoga sleep. You can find scripts for this online. Does they, it involve Ambien? It could, but in general, it involves just lying down and it walks you through um, some breathing and some focus, the kind of body scan type stuff that brings the brain into a state that's very similar to sleep. And it does seem to accelerate neuroplasticity. This is a practice that my lab studies. We, yeah. we take away all the naming and fancy yeah. kind of woo stuff and just focus on the physiology, the breathing and the brain states. But it's a very powerful tool for encouraging the nervous system to learn faster. Mm -hmm. And for people that have trouble sleeping, a lot of trouble in falling asleep is turning off your thoughts, <sighs> which is turning off the thing that makes you able to focus. Mm -hmm. So you can see how neuroplasticity is tricky. It's, yes. like, it's a combination lock that says focus and then defocus. Yeah. And very few people learn how to master that. But if you can learn how to master that, you we do not know if there are any upper bounds, any limits on plasticity. Mm -hmm. There probably aren't. What we do know is that it's harder to learn as an adult than it is as a child. But if you think alertness and focus to trigger plasticity and then deep rest and relaxation mm -hmm. to solidify, to create the plasticity, mm -hmm. you just keep toggling back and forth between those, mm -hmm. then you're well on your way to reshaping your nerve connections, your brain, in the ways that you want. But I think under, even just like you said, having an awareness of it, like the person I, when I was 25 and, you know, the guy I'm dating gets a text from an ex at two in the morning or gets a nude, but whatever it is. And I'm like- Did fired. that actually happen? 
Oh, I'm sure. I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm putting it back on like, you because yeah, you, like you, yes, of course that you know, or like you. The phone has changed relationships tremendously right? in a, in a big way, good and bad, and we can we can sort of get into the phone and and what that does to the brain at some point because I'm of course fascinated by that. But I mean, I'm up, I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm slamming the door. I'm just can you can we just talk through what happens to your brain and your judgment uh, when you are scared. I mean, right now we're all in peak fear, obviously, with what's going on um, in the news, but in our interpersonal relationships, or even for a lot of people, you know, myself included, your man getting a text, a nude photo at two in the morning or some text from an ex or something can be the same as your dad going, oh, really? Oh, congrats. Like, not being proud of you or your your mom saying or your sister saying something that's just like, you know, I know that, you know, my family members can devastate me with just like one little passive aggressive comment or backhanded, you know, whatever. Know that where that little gap in your force field is, right? And, they, and I just want to just talk to, you know, about what happens to your brain sure. when you're on those drugs. So the... Situations vary tremendously from person to person, but what you just described really illustrates the fact that we have one stress response system, one, and it's designed the same way regardless of what the stressor is. And so the stress response is very generic. So whether or not it's the troubling text that you see, whether or not it's the lack of affection, whatever it happens to be that's the trigger, the important thing to understand is it's very fast. It goes from the mind. Mm -hmm. So you perceive that thing. Mm -hmm. It's different from person to person, but you hear that thing or you don't hear that thing, you're triggered. Half a second, 500 milliseconds, mm. the body is engaged mm -hmm. also. The signal goes down to that core center. Of the Does your body cord. react before your brain? Brain reacts first. Brain reacts first. I mean, there are, there are exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. There are always exceptions. Um, where, you know, like a pain stimulus, you might have a defensive posture first, right, then right. it's conscious. But but these brain areas in the so-called limbic system, limbic just means edge because it's at the edge of the brain, but you can think about it as like falling off of your edge when the limbic system being near the edge. Yeah. The limbic system gets activated, sends a signal to the body, then the body liberates adrenaline. So now the body's engaged too. See, I want to start doing this in arguments. I'm going to be like, my limbic system's activated. Yeah. Well, like, you see people, I always think, well, everything I think is like through the lens of neuroscience, but it's like- You must be a dream to fight with. <laughs> I have, well, I'm human, you know? I, nightmare. I don't know. I, I, there are people out there that would, um, yeah, well- we can get into this, but projection is a very interesting thing that happens in arguments too. People can actually throw their anger into other people's nervous systems, which is what? amazing. Oh yeah. What? Yeah, Never uh, done it. Yeah, Don't know what you're talking is about. is a really powerful tool. Um, so the body's engaged. The moment the body's engaged, it, the moment you feel agitation, mm -hmm. it's because the generic chemicals are designed to move you. The mm -hmm. stress response was designed to get you to either stay put, move away, or move forward. So it's either stay put, retreat, or fight. There's really no other right. fourth option. Right. So the moment anyone out there feels that agitation, they have to recognize that their body's been hijacked. We talk about the brain being hijacked. Your body has Great also way to been put hijacked. It. So I always say it's hard to control the mind with the mind. You can mm. do it in your calmer states but it's very hard to control the mind with your mind when you've been activated. So the moment you feel agitation in your body, I recommend looking to behavior, control your body to then get control of the mind right. because they're, it's bi-directional. Brain controls body, body controls brain. That's why I suggest things like the physiological sigh or panoramic vision, things like that. Because the worst thing you can tell yourself or somebody who's stressed is calm down. Ugh. That's worse, right? Ugh. Or You're putting forget about it. On a fire. Or even take a deep breath, which is actually the, will have the opposite effect on your nervous system. It'll tend to ramp your yes. alertness up even more. Yeah, and don't say to your girl after listening to this, take two deep breaths. Right, do a physiological <laughs> sigh. <laughs> Go right? find a panorama. Right. If, 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 <laughs> if he does that or if she does that, you are free to introduce the eye roll to the That's physiological That's the new calm sigh. down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so that's why I like panoramic vision. It's completely covert. So you can, for people out there who want to learn how to remain calm mm -hmm. in stressful situations, panoramic vision is very powerful. And in addition to that, for the- Which means going outside and looking at a horizon. Or doing it right now. Let's say I say something that triggers you. You can look at me, but you can see what's going on in the corner of the room just at the look same time. To, look just look to the corner. expand your vision. Just stop looking at you. Basically, look that, look. I'm still in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> delete you. <laughs> but delete, right. But it start to include the full room. See if you can see yourself in this environment, even though we're not outside. Can you now do that? And then can you narrow your focus? 
Wait, what's what? happening? What? So you can contract or dilate your vagina. I t- eye contact makes me very nervous. So I'm now okay, like... Okay, so you should do it all the time. I just like went offline because right. you're looking in my eyes and it okay. made me panic. Because you know what? I never... Um, oh yeah, I, your pupils... Should, no, I'm kidding. Stop! No, no, I'm just oh, kidding. <laughs> I, I knew God. I was... I, I'm, that's for earlier. But I you, was told... This is a... And the, and, and the fact that I have not gotten into nurture yet is a, 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 a really illustrates my respect and love for you because I want so badly to get into the nurture part of this conversation because um, isn't it the amount of eye contact you get in the first couple years of your life? Like I just is so important in terms of your ability to make eye contact later in life. I just struggled for eye contact to make, see, I'm getting nervous. I'm panicking (laughs) for the longest time. Eye contact makes me very uneasy. It's gotten better in the last couple years. But when I first started, everybody said that I looked like, at the side of their ear when I talk to them. Do you ever like talk to people and that you think they're looking at your hairline or looking at your teeth? What you're doing is a really good example of exteroception. You're you're paying attention to what they're doing as a, you know, there are people that seem Does to- Does it look like I'm looking at you? Uh, yeah, your eyes are pointed <laughs> towards you. Okay. Um, a lot in, of people are like, you don't in look In ophthalmology it. speak, we'd say you're foveated <laughs> towards me. Yeah, oh, that's, that's right. But- we're both so afraid of interrupting each other. I want to, because on this podcast, we talk so much about nurture and something that they, in, I've learned a lot of in addiction, um, educating myself in addiction is something that we say a lot is uh, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Is that fair to say? Or is that just sound good? For many things, I think that's true. Look, everybody knows that I am a gourmet chef. Mm. I... I'm just to update her Wikipedia now. I'm a whiz in the kitchen. I am a culinary artiste. I am a magician. Delusional. I'm, <laughs> I am a magician, quite frankly, when it comes to Fred. I was going to say bread, and then I was going to say flour, and I said Fred. <laughs> Your magician is in, watch this, I'll deliver. I'll get it delivered. <laughs> but I can't cook all day. I want to, and I can very well quite frankly intimidatingly well but doordash i prefer oh me doordash is my best friend well i don't want to cook all the time because like i don't want to make anyone feel bad you know you live alone right i don't want to make them fe- <laughs> so no i don't i live with a couple imaginary friends and two ghosts <laughs> DoorDash. I'm obsessed with DoorDash. I use it constantly. Brings food you're craving right now, right to your door safely. They will leave it outside. They won't even talk to you, which is my favorite thing. (laughs) But they will. But if you have a problem, they'll fix it. They'll be like, we agree. And they'll fix it right away. Like what? Like say you have an issue and you're like, you know what? I ordered 18 wings and you only sent me seven. Sometimes I want to talk. And if you want to, because you're lonely... Not me, but the people who are, they will chat with you. They'll remember you when they come back. There's one guy that has a, that I met, my, a DoorDash guy, and he met my dogs, and I was like, do you have any dogs? And he was like, stop talking to me, you sad lady. And he showed me his blue German Shepherd. He has a German Shepherd that's gray. Well, we call it blue. And he lives here now. And, if, <laughs> and we're together. DoorDash <laughs> is actually a dating app. <laughs> yeah, who knew? <laughs> uh, 300,000 uh partners in the u.s puerto rico canada and australia you can support your local go-to's which is really important right now in the pandemic support your local restaurants choose from your favorite national restaurants as well like chipotle love it uh some of the best I've, dates i've ever gone on were at chipotle wendy's <laughs> nope. wendy's oh yeah get them nuggets right to your door uh and uh okay sorry my dog is freaking out because i'm talking about doordash he knows that when i talk about doordash that means there's going to be some food on the way the cheesecake factory get yourself treat yourself we're in a pandemic order a cheesecake from doordash that's called self-care contact this delivery it's always safe we said that already i know i just want to make sure that's very important okay right now our listeners can get five dollars off their first order of fifteen dollars or more zero delivery fees for their first month when you download the doordash app and enter what code whitney and that's a big deal no delivery fees for a month did you just point at me yeah i did <laughs> was that an air gun i wanted you to get I, that, you get that point across that's- five dollars off your first order of cheesecake hopefully and zero delivery fees for a month when you download the doordash app in the app store <laughs> and enter the code whitney, whitney. don't forget yeah. that's code whitney for five dollars off your first order with doordash Benton. Whitney. I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to believe. No one's going to believe it. People are going to accuse me of being a liar. 
Is that that you go to therapy? <laughs> uh, sometimes I stink. Oh. Mm-hmm. I know it's hard to believe. I know. It is <laughs> tough to believe. <laughs> that, you of all people. Believe it or not, I sweat like a pig. <laughs> Pigs don't even sweat. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and I did not wear deodorant for the longest time because it deodorant is chock full of chemicals. Oh, yeah. Bad stuff. Like, like aluminum and talc talcum bad yeah very bad and what it's not the full name not talcum talcum go to your room (laughs) because what it does is it aluminum clogs your pores and actually stops you from sweating and then sweat comes out other and then your body absorbs the aluminum into it but then it's like then you start sweating other places like your crevices get swampy and it's like it's like your sweating becomes like (laughs) whack-a-mole comes out other places you start putting your deodorant on other places it's really hard so the point is I never wore deodorant until I discovered Native. Native? I've been a long-time user of Native. I see. I didn't know that. Which is why I never stink. How am I just finding out about Native deodorant? It's amazing. I use the um, uh, coconut vanilla one. Oh, it smells so good. I I do lavender and rose because I'm a lady. I'm a Parisian queen. Okay? But it's made out of coconut oil, shea butter, tapioca starch. It's vegan, never tested on animals, which is why we love, 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 love. Tapioca them um native will keep you smelling fresh all day long you have no excuse to stink you guys let's just get to it, it n- it's disgusting. nothing ruins Don't be a situation more than smelling someone's body odor it's rude it's tacky. It's unacceptable. It's inappropriate. Yeah, I don't like this whole like. Well, I don't wear deodorant because you know my body. And well, I can smell who your. Who are body. you hanging out with? That's a bit. Oh, that's a thing. <laughs> also, like we're wearing masks and we're six feet apart. If I can still smell you, pull it together. Yeah. Native deodorant, risk free. Every product comes with free shipping in the U.S. plus thirty day returns and exchanges. See why so many people love Native and check out over fourteen thousand five star reviews. Wow, no one likes anything. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah, but they love this. I know. Look at that. <laughs> Sometimes guys, when you're like making out with a guy and they like get near your armpit, you're like, oh no, and they're like, Whoa. like. <laughs> what guy is getting under your armpit? <laughs> I'm just saying, guys. Sometimes like. There's like a fear response to hide. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) I'm just saying, you trust me. Trust me, there's a deodorant. Guys, you know when guys crawl into your armpits for safety? (laughs) This deodorant will really. I'm just telling you, I've had some bad experiences in the past with sketchy deodorants and guys' mouths, and I've not had that problem with native. What are you talking about? (laughs) I just trust me. You girls know what I'm talking about. Girls. You girls know when your boyfriend eats off all your deodorant <laughs> and makes that with you? Freaks. They're freaks, girls. I'm just telling you, it's, I'm just, you, you well, guys. <laughs> I don't know that Native is edible, but anyways, <laughs> oh, make the switch to Native today by going to <laughs> nativedeo.com slash Whitney or use promo code Whitney at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com. As in deodorant. Yep. <laughs> dot com slash Whitney and use promo code Whitney at checkout for 20% off your first order. Ta-da! The way the brain shows up in the world on day one, assuming that baby went full term, you know, um, but a preemie baby is taken out of the little incubator or whatever they use. And on day one, there is a significant amount of what we would call hard wiring. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. You want that baby's heart to beat without it having to learn how to do that. Breathe, digestion, all those things. There are a certain number of biases built into the nervous system based on genetics. Maybe, and this is still open questions, but for instance, startle reflex, how susceptible they are, someone is to startle, how calm they are. Some babies are just calm from day one. They're like the bulldogs of the world. You can't shock them. But it, does any of that have to do with what happened uh, it, to the neurochemicals of the mother while they were in utero? Could be. But I think there's a significant amount of hardwiring. There are genetic programs that come from mom and dad Mm -hmm. that make sure that there's a nervous system that's a rough template or map of what that child might expect in life. Then you have neuroplasticity, which allows the brain to be customized according to experience. And we know this because of twin studies, two identical twins in the same sac inside, which is important. They call it monochorionic, meaning in the same sac or dichorionic. If there's a little boundary between those two babies, they can actually have very different nervous systems compared to if they are in the same sack, even if they're identical twins. Yeah. Even so, yeah, there's all this stuff about twin concordance it's called. So there are biases and then that kid shows up in the world 
And it's interesting to think about the relationship between nature and nurture, because let's say that that kid has a genetic bias to be more calm mm -hmm. and to explore her or his environment in a more calm way. Well, then they're going to learn things differently and maybe become even more calm. Right. So it, it, right. It's, it's what we call a Mobius strip. It's there. You can't separate it at any one point. Now, there are, is clearly a strong role for nurturing and experience, mm -hmm. but the genetic component is something that, you know, a lot of people are uncomfortable with because we love this idea of a tabla rasa, of a blank slate, and you can just write your entire neurology yourself or depending on where you're raised. But there are these genetic biases, some of them like um, perfect pitch. Or some people have perfect pitch. They, they Yeah, they know when a when note is 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 off or something. Uh, other people seem to be tone deaf, right? Something about the bones in your ear. Could be something at the at the periphery. Um, what we do know is every human, assuming there isn't some developmental defect, comes into the world with the same sensors. The same sensors in the eye. Mm -hmm. A colorblind person might be missing one, but the same sensors in the eye. The same touch sensors in the skin. Um, since you mentioned weight blankets, I'll just use this as an opportunity to try and answer your question. Even though it's off topic, it's a relevant tangent. There are sensors in all of our skin yeah. that respond to light touch. There are sensors that respond to firm touch. Believe it or not, little little things that fire different electric signals to the brain saying, that's too tough, that's yeah. nice and you know gentle, or that yeah. feels weird, or that yeah. handshake feels creepy, yeah, or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> that's big, or tickle, or cold, or pain. All of those are in everybody. Right. And the, the feeling of distributed weight across big surfaces of our body mm -hmm. does connect to a neural pathway that promotes calm. So it makes sense to me that a weight blanket would mm -hmm. be used to calm, that would have a calming effect. Right. right. Like when I am stressed out, I put my Great Dane pit bull on my chest. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it has something to do with him, but it's also just like the weights well, make me feel so much or, better. And holding a pillow here is yes. a common practice. Yes. Well, the reason is that we have an abundance of the receptors that I'm referring to mm -hmm. here on our chest. So weighted blankets work. Weighted, if you like pressure, yeah. weighted blankets work for a logical reason related to the sensors in our skin. But that's different bone. than a hug. Hug is you get oxytocin from, right? That's different. Oxytocin is this, right, the chemical hormone that's released that tells you you're safe. Mm -hmm. It tells you there's somebody there that would uh, protect you, mm -hmm. that there's somebody there that's that's on your side. Unless the hug's a little too long. Unless the hug's a little <laughs> too long. And then there's, then there's another molecule, which I, I'm guessing that, um, well, you probably know about it, but it's called tachykinin. It's a peptide that's released when we don't get enough social or physical contact with other people. Mm. This is a discovery of a guy named David Anderson's laboratory here at Caltech, a phenomenal researcher. And tachykinin is released in our bodies when we haven't had enough human contact. Which we're probably all going through right now. And it increases guess. fear, <gasps> threshold to fear, and aggression. So it's that kind of a not not the is kind of is that what's happening with all of us in quarantine and not being able to socialize? Well, tachykinin releases. Is that why cancel culture started? Tachykinin? Do we have that to blame? And yeah, we could blame. We Everyone's could, just like we every, need to cancel tachykinin. Every, <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. I'm just saying. Everyone. Will I get in trouble for canceling? I don't saying know. That? No. <laughs> I, don't think I don't know so. who's who owns the patent on tachykinin. No, everyone makes tachykinin. Mice make it. Dogs make because it. Because we are not designed to be solitary. We are designed to have a certain amount of eye contact a day, a certain amount of physical touch a day, and we are also isolated now. Also, just in general, like the the solo. Uh, the departure from tribal villages to now just everyone living in apartments alone. And mm -hmm. um, doesn't that tell us on a like subconscious primordial level, like we've been ousted from the tribe or don't have protection mm -hmm. from the tribe or something? Yeah, these chemical systems, earlier we we're talking about adrenaline and norepinephrine and all these things that make us activated. The other chemical system, which is the one that we're talking about now, I mean, there are several, is serotonin and oxytocin. Those are the things that are released with thoughts of gratitude, mm. social connection, physical touch. Which is why just saying, I mean, a big part of 12-step programs, I'm going to keep bringing this up because there's so much um, uh, pr scientific proof of why a lot of this stuff kind of like works. Like one of the biggest tools is a gratitude list. If you're in a bad place, you just start write down, writing down things you're grateful for. And it seems corny and it seems annoying and it seems stupid and I hate doing it, but there is a neurological basis for why it works. Absolutely. Gratitude is not complacency. And I do some work with people mm. in special operations military. You'd be surprised how many like truly high performers in high risk, high consequence jobs use gratitude practices to reset themselves, mm. to be able to lean back into high stress, high exertion type things. So the, the way to think about biology and neuroscience is that it uses very few ingredients to cook up everybody's experience. And so everyone, we're all very attached to our own life experience because 
it's unique. It's unique to us, our parents, our upbringing, where we're at, where we're going, what we want, what we want to avoid. But the chemicals are all the same. You use dopamine to feel a sense of elation and reward. And dopamine is really the molecule of desire of right. wanting to pursue things. Right. And you use serotonin and oxytocin. Anytime you feel like you have enough, you're safe. Mm. Whatever that comes from, the weighted blanket, dogs, close social connections, whatever that is. I use the exact same chemicals, but I'm wired so that slightly different things release those chemicals, but a lot of the same things. All human beings were wired such that serotonin and oxytocin are released in response to, to nurturing physical touch mm -hmm. and connection. Yeah. And tachykinin is released when we don't get enough of it. Right. That's a non-negotiable aspect of our biology. Mm -hmm. So I don't care how tough somebody is or how um, weak somebody is, you know, to, to use, you know, coarse language. In the end, it's the same chemicals that are cooking these things up. And what's important to understand about the way these chemicals work is that they're controlled subjectively. Like, it's not like you touch somebody and they kind of, well, maybe they like dribble a little serotonin in your ear. <laughs> That's weird, like dribble serotonin in your ear. But, but it's all internal. Serotonin is released from this area called the raphe nucleus in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. Like it's, they, uh, acetylcholine is released from the nucleus basalis. It's not like everyone does it differently. Everyone's doing this stuff the same way. It's like, they're all kept in the same locations on everybody's cooking uh, shelf in the kitchen. Right. Until I do a lot of cooking. <laughs> I, it's like babies <laughs> cooking. I'm, cooking. I'm not very show. domestic. I, I, I'm not I, very domestic. But I think you that know? your brain, right. it's like, I'm just listening to you speak in like literally Latin. I think that just like your hippocampus is full of those words. So there's right. no space for basic things like a cabinet. It's bad. I grew up in this. I, like, I got in this neuroscience I, thing really young. I like, and I, I, sort I like, of like that you, you know. don't know basic words of like shelf and yeah, refrigerator, really but you know, you know, I've like heard of shelf and refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> but but when I think refrigerator, you say that, and I think of a lab refrigerator yeah, with a see, bunch of chemicals. That's so and, dark and I sad. <laughs> I like that you just don't know basic. There are there water. are people that would like, agree to you. Right, yeah, what would you call this? Distilled water. No, yeah. no <laughs> bottle. <laughs> non ionized. Water. Yeah, no. no just just keep it just simple. water. Sorry if I'm using too much. No, no, I love it. The point it. is I'm that I'm just going to keep. That the, it down. The, the, you know, we think, um, to use an analogy, like proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, everyone's probably heard of those. Those are, you know, the macronutrients that make up all foods. Some foods have more than others of each of those, of course. Different emotional states, different states of feeling good or afraid. Mm -hmm. Serotonin, oxytocin, acetylcholine, dopamine, those are the macronutrients of our experiences. Right. Right. And I want to sort of talk about these these serotonin and dopamine, all these things that um, uh, these neurochemicals that kind of drive our choices, that drive what feels good, what feels comfortable. And, you know, humans are so paradoxical and complicated in this area because I like to break down, why is my friend staying in this bad relationship? Why is this guy dating this girl who he thinks is psycho and crazy and et cetera, right? So a lot of times, things that are ostensibly bad feel good, right? We tend to recreate our childhood circumstances if we don't intervene in some way and, and actively try to course correct it. We almost subconsciously try to find that warm hug of dysfunction that whatever neurochemical cocktail was emitted, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very comfortable in a time of crisis and chaos. And it makes people in my life very confused. I am calm in a time of crisis. And when things are calm, I am always waiting for the other shoe to drop. I get anxious when things aren't going wrong. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a Damocles sword hanging and uh, things are about to go wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. So that I believe is from my nurture. Mm -hmm. um, Harville Hendricks talks about how we're attracted to people who have the negative qualities of our primary caretakers. And I'm just curious about like the neurological perspective on that. Are we sort of subconsciously seeking whatever combination of adrenaline, cortisol, serotonin, dopamine that we got as kids? You know, are we kind of zombies to that when you see people who can't stop dating crazy people, people that make them feel bad, people that make them feel jealous? Are they just recreating that mixture of whatever their mom and dad created? Yeah, those are great questions. So um, I'll approach them in sequence. The first one is this thing about you being calm in stressful situations. I think that could, there's a neuroscience lens and interpretation on, on that, is that it could reflect the fact that internally you seem to be pretty high energy. Like that metronome tends to be more like tick, 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 mm -hmm. than like tick, tick. We know people that's like, come on, like you can't engage yeah. them. So when the world matches your internal processing speed, and that match of what's going on inside and outside are both kind of high speed, it's gonna feel aligned. It's gonna feel right, okay? 
Otherwise, it might seem like the world is passing by a little too slowly for you, mm. right? Because you're high functioning. This is what we call like high functioning. It's a reflection of having a really well-developed forebrain, and I, which is an asset. You can make plans. You can yeah. do creative work. I mean, let's yeah. let's. But then for, you end up overcommitting yourself and exhausting yourself and being less high functioning if you don't have some kind of moderation. Right. It needs to be bounded, yeah. but it's not. I wouldn't see it as a detriment, but it means that too much placidity and calm is going to feel kind of stressful mm -hmm. because there's that mismatch. Makes me anxious. And for people that are very low energy. Me on a vacation is a nightmare. I've got my clipboard. I'm like, we're doing this. We're going to see whale right. sharks. We're going to do this. Yeah. And, and for some people that are really exhausted or burnt out, whatever that is, or they're kind of low energy, mm -hmm. the world is going to seem like it's going by really fast. Uh, That's kind of oppressive, mm. right? And I think people are just wired differently. And the reason I bring up dogs is not just because you like dogs and I like dogs, but because you look at the different dog breeds mm -hmm. and they are selected for this, what we call autonomic baseline, this temperament. The, the straightforward way of saying is you meet my bulldog Costello and it's like, it takes a lot to activate him. The they're, whole world must seem like it's going by a million miles an hour. They that are guy. bred to do different things. That's I'm, right. Now I'm really That's understanding right. this right. metaphor in a, in a real way before I was pretending I understood it. Now I actually understand it because when people, I do a lot of dog rescue and when people are like, oh my God, I want to get this husky. I'm like, if you get this husky is bred to work, it needs two hours a right. day of exercise. It'll go crazy. Not negotiable. Doesn't matter That's what right. kind of nurture it does. It it does not matter. This is just how this thing is wired. Um, uh, Australian shepherds. Everyone wants an Australian shepherd now, and then they get it's the the ones with no tail. They're herding dogs. Yeah. Right. And that's the only way they can experience the world is they get very anxious if they can't organize things. They get very they get uh, an Australian shepherd sitting right here would be very anxious about the layout of this podcast studio because mm -hmm. everyone needs to get herded together and. The dog would constantly be going in circles trying to get us all in a group. They heard, and that's the only way that they can experience the world. And apartment living with a couple, someone's in the bedroom, someone's in the living room, really stresses them out. Mm -hmm. Some pe And so, a lot of dogs, their temperament is calm. Other breeds are bred for an alertness and an awareness of their environment. Mm -hmm. It was They were selected for that. Right. So this, this is a, I would say, is probably the best example I can give for the nature-nurture thing. Those dogs come in, bulldogs come into the world kind of function a little bit slower than a whippet. Right. Right. Nothing against the bulldogs. I own a bulldog. Yeah. I love them. But they're bred for different things. The bulldog <laughs> I love that was you know how intense yeah. dog people are. Right, yeah. The, yeah <laughs> if you look, criticize a breed. <laughs> if, if you want to understand I will say if you want to understand neuroscience and the relationship between nature and nurture, spend time with animals. Yes. Because you'll see different temperaments and spend time with a lot of different species mm -hmm. of animals. Spend time with grazing animals. Spend, mm -hmm. Watch the eyes of a of a lion that lays around during the day and then when it hunts, its eyes, what, the pupils dilate? It, right. bring, it Literally, the eyes move forward mm -hmm. in the head. You're looking at the brain, the eyes, changing in response to level mm -hmm. of alertness. That's us when we're in stress. Yes. So you see it in animals best. We are animals. But what you described, this alertness and this ability to make plans and anticipate things and bring in a lot of memory that is the those are the the basic components of creative and great works and i think it's no no coincidence that you're a creative in addition to other things that's you know your job is based on creating new novel things that's what humans are good at taking existing elements reorganizing them and creating new things that's what we do and the the forebrain is designed for that and it feels like agitation or stress but that's also what allowed us to become who we are. Well, that's the thing. I uh, we always joke that I always say there's a war on on something. There's a war on stress, and there's a war on anxiety. And I'm, you know, for me, I think because I've spent so much of my life ignoring my intuition and ignoring my gut. And for me, sometimes fear and anxiety are synonymous with that of this, like, I have a bad feeling about this person. I have a bad feeling about this situation, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. Cause I think a lot of, you know, especially, you know, women have been programmed to calm down, relax, you're oversensitive, you're overthinking it, where guys have been programmed to, you're being a pussy, man up, you know? So we have this sort of programming that has, I think, in a big way, conditioned us to minimize and oftentimes ignore. Uh, fear and anxiety. And so now when I see so much conversation about getting rid of fear and anxiety, and I'm like, to me, those are my guardian angels. And I now am um, very grateful for my ability mm -hmm. to feel my fear and anxiety. And I try to listen to it. But I think the hardest part is delineating what's rational, what's irrational, what's helpful mm -hmm. fear and anxiety, and right. what's paralyzing fear and anxiety. How do you know the difference? Well, it's same chemicals, always going to be a double-edged sword. Remember, neuroplasticity is good. Neuroplasticity is bad. It, it wires in traumas. It's mm -hmm. what allows you to unwire traumas. Y you asked about couples and 
um, destructive patterns or people who are in destructive patterns of relating. Because I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be very honest with you. When my guy friends are like, I'm dating this girl, she's a fucking psycho. I'm like, you love it. You love it and right. you know you love it because it's unpredictable and it's surprising and you're getting all this dopamine from the fact that you never know where she is and she cheated on you or whatever. Right. You know, their dopamine is wired for, well, let me um, try and explain this um, from a slightly different perspective. So um, he's not the favorite of, of most people, um, but I, I'm a big fan. So Freud had a word for what you describe. It's called the repetition compulsion. Mm. So Freud's assessment was that when we experience something traumatic, early in childhood or any time in childhood that we recreate patterns that will bring us back into that experience as a way to try and solve that, to, to react yeah. to it differently. Because, you know, it is true that, a, you know, a 25 year old will react very differently to this, uh, the same traumatic experience relived as a 25 year old than a five year old, mm -hmm. right? They just have a capacity that a five year old doesn't have. That was mm -hmm. Freud's assessment. What's True neurobiologically, what we can say for sure neurobiologically, is that the brain circuits, the connections in the brain and the brain areas that are responsible for infant parent attachment mm -hmm. are not discarded when we hit age 25. It's not right. like, oh, I don't need my mom and my dad anymore, so I'm going to just get rid of that brain area. Right. Those brain areas are used for attachment in romantic relationships. Now that gets a little eerie to people because no, they're like, like, "Oh, it sounds very Oedipal, Electra complex, right?" No, when but you realize if you really think you throw away real estate in the brain, you're like, "Oh, don't need that anymore." That that's not like the the kid's toy room that then you graduate to college and you go off to a dorm. Mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way. That neural real estate is reused. So, so are we just trying to uh, f uh, pattern recognition? Are we trying to recreate patterns or find comfortable patterns of like, you know, I used to do this joke about like every time we meet someone, we're like, "Mama, Dad, Dad." Like, I mean, just all the time. The, are you my mother? When you're dating, Facebook? yeah. yeah. I think there are elements of that. I mean, some people react to their upbringing by looking for people that are the exact opposite, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to use a, an example that at first might seem a little odd. And this isn't, I want to be really clear, is not an attempt to bring things into um, a kind of salacious or um, or sexual discussion. But there, I want I mean, to talk- you're in the right place if you do. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about it from the bio biological standpoint. I'm just so, trying to not get you fired. I'm trying to restrain myself. Well, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about the biology as, as we understand it. I'm, and I'm- you know, I don't know everything, so I'm going to make mistakes as I as I talk. I I, I do. I hope so I don't. Good. I'll fill not, in any blanks that you don't know. <laughs> let's talk about some biological hardwiring as it relates to mate choice. Let's pick the most. Let's pick the one that everyone agrees on. Can I? Can I? Uh, can you quiz me? Uh, sure. Although I'm not sure you want me to quiz you on this one because <laughs> what, what I'm what about is to say. What's the most important thing? What's the most important thing in terms of mate choice? Is this a trick question? No. Smell pretty good you're impressed um, admit it smell might play a role in it but wh what's the, what's mother nature's punishment mother nature punishes this behavior very severely mother nature punishes this behavior very severely incest yes which is why when someone smells bad it means you're related to them in some way right so since you threw that out there if you give a hundred mice <laughs> My producers are just laughing. So if you give... <laughs> Your gap is unbelievable. I, so, I, well, I'm, I'm trying to... I just want to make sure that I close whatever <laughs> hatches we open and... and um, but, no. So... <laughs> I feel, I feel like I, I feel like the I, stun response. I feel like yeah. I'm. Am I blowing your mind? <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I'm starting to learn where you get your dopamine hits. Um, so incest is not good. Uh, the, Don't everyone do it. everyone agrees that incest is bad, and not there's ideal. a biological penalty for incest that leads to offspring right. leads to mutations that are less vigorous yes mating with close of kin in yes. any animal but in particular in humans is very bad yep. for the offspring right so there's that means that th that's the most hardwired example i can give of bad mate choice right that literally means that there's a punishment for mating with close of kin mm -hmm. you have to talk to them yeah. <laughs> i don't even know how to process that <laughs> so that means there's a genetic there's a genetic penalty. Yeah. Okay. If you give a hundred mice choice of, uh, sorry, you give one mouse a choice of a hundred mice as a mate, uh -huh. opposite sex mate, they will pick the one that has the immune composition that is furthest from their own mm -hmm. without realizing why they do it. 
But is it from smell? It's from smell. Okay. It's through what are called pheromones. So hormones are things that are secreted in our body, right. act on other tissues in our body. Mm -hmm. Pheromones are things that are secreted by one member of a species, mm -hmm. act on other members of a species. Mm -hmm. Or it can be across species, but generally. So like, pay attention to what someone smells like. Well, the, some of these studies have been controversial, and this, um, but there are some solid data that show that if you, women in particular, if they are given, say, 50 T-shirts to smell, yeah. and all of these have been washed in the same washer with soap and all that mm. stuff, they can pick out their significant other's shirt mm -hmm. with a high degree of specificity, meaning much better than chance, okay? So that's pheromones in action. Mm -hmm. Synchronization of menstrual cycles amongst women that are group housed. Mm -hmm. Sounds like animals, but group, you know what I right, mean. Right, right. There's some data now that say that might not be as strong effect as, as once was thought, but most women will tell you it's a pretty strong effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, things like that. So. Mate choice on the extreme is like incest is bad, all right? Then you think, okay, well, what makes somebody pick somebody that's not good for them psychologically? Right. So then you have to look to something that's probably more rooted in developmental upbringing. Mm. And the question is, are they template matching? Are they matching the, oh, you know, I had a, a dad that raged and so I like men who are very aggressive and then they mm. end up in an abusive relationship? Mm -hmm. or, because I, because this just create, it's just a comfortable, uh, sort of equilibrium of neurochemicals that's just i i think it boils down to the so we have to ask ourselves what are the chemicals and hormones of a, of sexual attraction mm -hmm. and those tend to be dopamine and testosterone in men mm -hmm. and dopamine and estrogen in women mm -hmm. people think that estrogen is the opposite of testosterone but actually prolactin mm -hmm. is the opposite of testosterone and estrogen in terms of its brain effects we can get into this but so People are attracted to certain people because of this release of this neurochemical dopamine, which mm -hmm. makes them excited. It's the, it is the the molecule of desire. It's closely tethered to estrogen in women and to testosterone Does in men. Does adrenaline turn into dopamine? No, but adrenaline can. So this is interesting. So for some people, high levels of adrenaline mm -hmm. activate the dopamine and testosterone response. Mm -hmm. And testosterone in both men and women is responsible for libido and sort of attraction. So someone that, for some people, someone that causes you stress right. could then give you dopamine. Absolutely. So let's just, let's create a, what Einstein would have called a Gedanken experiment. It was just in our minds. This is not a laboratory experiment, but in line with this hypothesis, somebody grows up in a household where there's a lot of aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. And they swear they're never going to get involved with somebody right. who has that like hair trigger kind of aggressive behavior. Then you, f they find themselves and their friends find that person in a relationship mm. with somebody who has that kind of behavior. And they feel like it's a turn on. They, they're attracted to that person. It might not even be sexual excitement, but it's they're drawn to that person. Yeah, drawn. It could be that adrenaline, that whole circuit for adrenaline has been wired to recruit things like dopamine and the sexual response when they experience that kind of heightened level of activation. Yeah. There are pretty good data showing that adrenaline can trigger testosterone as long as it's not too much. Hmm. If there's too much adrenaline, then testosterone is is suppressed and makes cortisol. We make cortisol instead, rather. So you could imagine that people repeat these patterns, mm -hmm. this, what Freud would have called the repetition compulsion, on the basis of some early template that was learned, mm. not as hardwired as incest, which is absolutely categorically without question bad at a biological level, mm -hmm. right? I think Hot al almost everyone would agree that, mm. right? And the ones that wouldn't are the ones we got to be concerned about, right? Right. Is so then, uh, sorry, but no. so when people say they like crazy, like they go, oh, you know, he's crazy or she's crazy. Or pretend crazy. they don't. Or, people that are attracted to drama right. that are always with, you know, in some kind of chaos. Right. We all know those people. Right. And maybe, and that largely presumably reflects an internal chaos that they're trying to pattern match with, mm -hmm. or their life is dull and it's the one thing that takes them out of their life of dullness. I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't speculate on that, but the neurochemicals of attraction and desire are very simple. It's dopamine. Mm -hmm. We think of dopamine as the reward. People always say like sex triggers dopamine or money triggers dopamine. It's not, it's not so much having sex or acquiring money. It's the pursuit of sex mm -hmm. or money. That's right. It's, it's the gambler. It's the person who's going to get high. This is where these, and now we're talking about it in a dark way, but I want to be clear. The dopamine system is one of the reasons why we evolved to leave the territories we were raised in and go find new territories mm. to build businesses to seek 
healthy relationships mm. to seek degrees or careers. I mean, it is the molecule of pursuit of anything that lies outside motivation. the boundaries of our skin. Motivation. Low dopamine, low motivation. Low dopamine, ahedonia, sadness. Serotonin is the feel good with what you've got. And when you look at drugs of abuse, you start to see these in their extreme. Somebody on cocaine is mm -hmm. all about pursuit of something, mm -hmm. right? Especially cocaine and amphetamine. And if you see people who are cocaine and steroids, you're talking testosterone and dopamine. It's yeah. all pursuit, pursuit, pursuit. Pursuit of me. Cocaine addicts love me. I don't know if it's a hair. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a, oh, I just don't have a scientific explanation for it. So I'm just going to say, you have a strong data point. You <laughs> is know? there something yeah. about me yeah. that makes addicts love me? Explain. Uh, they are associating you with uh, the dopamine experience. With their mom. <laughs> I, um, I'm their drunk mom. The serotonin, if you think about drugs like marijuana or the opioid system, mm -hmm. those tend to make people pretty happy to just sit there and do nothing. Yeah. Right now, I realize there are, yes. there are um, some people that, because marijuana is legal in California, that the cannabis crew comes after me with pitchforks, although very slowly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I want to say is, I mean, there are, I'm talking about extremes here. I'm mm -hmm. talking about abuse of chemicals um, in all cases. But the serotonin system tends to make people pretty quiescent. And so, and I know couples that are both both very placid mm -hmm. and they seem so happy together, right? Yeah. They're not, they're, somehow they've created a bubble where the whole reward system is within that bubble. They're, they're secretly in an open relationship or- <laughs> They're bringing tea to each other. each other. Yeah, they're, the, they're wearing horse right. masks or something. I mean, you see this stuff all over social media. The memes that you see of, or the pictures of couples together, the mm. sunsets, all that. You can think of those as very serotonin or very dopamine. The get after it Monday morning is for sharks or whatever. I see this yeah, stuff. I'm yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. That's all just these neurochemical, different neurochemical systems. That's right. But when people get into a pattern of pursuing things that are detrimental to their goals, like they want to raise a healthy, safe family, or they want to be in a relationship that feels nurturing and physically and emotionally safe, and they're making choices that are not in line with that. Mm -hmm. I do think it's worth looking to developmental upbringing and say, well, maybe yeah. my reward system is attached to exactly the thing that is wrong for mm. me. They need to start engaging their forebrain and acknowledge that it's going to take a while. Like I keep sabotaging myself. Right. I'm trying to just put this in like- Right. Self-sabotage. Um, people that are making poor, poor decisions and excitement and sexual arousal are closely linked. Mm -hmm. Sexual arousal and relationships, I last heard, are are closely linked. I mm -hmm. think that's a fair and safe uh, assessment. It's not the thing that brings together two members of a species to decide to invest resources are these chemical systems. Mm. Um, other systems as well, plans and things, but at, at its core, the glue is a chemical glue. Because let me, I'm going to just say something non-scientific. Like, <laughs> this might not land great. But like, you know, when you have a really good friend and they've dated a bunch of people and then the person they pick to be like their husband or wife, you're like, what? Her or him? That's the one? This is not okay. Like there's something else going on here. And then usually the discussion is, well, maybe there's something we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. There's always like <laughs> that like there's always the like, maybe there's something we don't know, right? Yeah, totally. Right? It's sort of like, what is she doing that I don't know about? Is this is she doing kegels? Like, what's happening? When you're just like, that's the person, and you're like, Oh, there's some other thing going on right. here. Yeah. I think that it it's perplexing. Yeah. You know, when we see these things. Uh, you know, there's another example that's um maybe a little uncomfortable for people, but and I don't use these examples to make people uncomfortable, but when you look at non-randomness. Biology is very uncomfortable. <laughs> biology is uncomfortable. <laughs> non-randomness. So the incest thing where there's a genetic penalty, um, fetishes are an interesting topic. Oh, love well. it. Why do so many guys want to fuck my feet? Uh, <laughs> I was about to say great question, but oh my goodness. Um, so if you- They're disgusting. I mean, they're, I don't have good feet. So, um, they look like E.T.'s fingers. So, <laughs> I'm just saying, oh I don't, but I, they do My well training my... did not prepare <laughs> me for this. <laughs> well, it's like um, my, my second toe is like, is slightly longer than my first toe. I don't know why anyone would want to. Isn't that supposed to be a sign of royalty? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Somebody actually. gets me. Yeah. You that's, me. that's, that's actually this is been. a scientist. Well, f so digit, are you going to take me off track? Digit ratio. So I was part of a paper that was published in the year 2000 with a group out of Berkeley. It was published in the journal Nature. Digit ratios are dictated in utero by hormone exposure. Whoa. Yeah. And we can talk about this because it had implications for 
um, heterosexual versus homosexual mate choice. This is a published paper. Wow. It's also true in animals. And I can give you that story um, if you want in a, in a few minutes. But let me um, let's talk about fetishes <laughs> let's talk first. talk about fucking my feet. So the interesting thing about fetishes is um, they're not random. Mm. People don't develop fetishes to lampposts. Very rare if they do, right? right? Or um, paper towels. Almost all the fetishes are to things that are infectious. Feet, feces, corpses. These are like, there are fetishes that are outside those realms. But, but is the but, feet from crawling around as a baby and seeing your mom's feet? I'm going to make a different argument, okay. which is somewhat conjecture. But there's a, there are circuits in our hypothalamus. We get this area right above the roof of our mouth that is called the hypothalamus. It is every bit as important as the amygdala and all the other, the hippocampus and all the other stuff that you hear about because it controls things like temperature regulation, sexual behavior. It's extremely important. The hypothalamus has neurons that control appetitive behaviors, meaning things we want to move toward, hmm. the mm stuff. Yeah. And then it also has neurons that live right next door to those neurons that control what we call aversive behaviors, the ugh, the move away thing, right? Yeah. That was a Yiddish ugh, Yeah, I was going to say, you guys have so yeah, many complicated hard... terms, just yeah. recoiling, being Approach, grossed out. Approach, retreat. Yeah. Grossed out desire whatever right. the reason i use those terms is in case we want to go look up more <laughs> and um and just to make sure that it you know i, I stay within the bounds of, of some of the, the work on this stuff so these cir these neurons control brain circuits that were designed to either move us towards things right food sex warmth when we're cold cool when we're warm mm. etc mm -hmm. or move us away from things that were dangerous to mm -hmm. us so think about vomit feces feet those corpses, those things are not just gross. Mm -hmm. They are actually dangerous. They're dangerous from an infection standpoint. And it is no surprise that you have neurons that push you toward things, draw you, I should say, toward mm -hmm. you, toward things that are good for you. Right. Sugar, fat, reproduction. We are a species that needs to propagate. Right, right. Et cetera. Oops, but Con it needs to be context appropriate, age appropriate, species appropriate, all that stuff. But you know what I mean? But also circuits that are aversive that force us to recoil the the no like gross and disgust pathogen avoidance so it's kind of pathogen avoidance so it's kind of interesting to think that to reflect on the fact that many fetishes are rooted in a crossover between desire and these things that are dangerous to us i mean before antibiotics which everyone's anti-antibiotics but antibiotics have saved many lives have cured many infections <laughs> there are with their appropriate use those things were dangerous. The reason we put bodies in the ground is because decaying bodies are infectious. Mm -hmm. So there's an uncomfortable, and if people are feeling some discomfort even just hearing these phrases, mm -hmm. that's the- That's good. Th those are the circuits I'm talking about. In be. action right now. Well, it, so things like incest or or corpses or things, that, the reason we recoil to by those- By the way, dolls, robots, you know, like when people look at my robot, they get freaked out and weirded out. Non-animated forms of And they say of it life. looks like something that would be sick or dead. That's Don't right. Don't fuck this thing. The hypothetical thalamus could very well be thinking that what you people just, get creeped out by dolls said. by robots by That's clowns right. Right. anything that looks right. human but is right. a little off right so those are circuits where and i'm not out here to demonize people's behavior i'm not a psychologist i'm not i'm not i'm not judging anyone's behavior or choices but you can start to think of because you're asking the question, how is it that the thing that is worst for us is the thing that we desire? Yes. Why does this person go after it? Well, it means at a core level, it means that there is neural circuitry that has been wired up so that the thing that is supposed to be aversive mm -hmm. has become appetitive. It put into English, it means the thing that you're supposed to say that's disgusting yeah. is attractive to you. Yeah. And I'm not putting any kind of moral judgment here one way or the other. I'm talking about what is safe biologically mm -hmm. and evolutionarily speaking and what is not what's advantageous for our species and historically what has been disadvantageous or maladaptive. So there are people that like chaos and drama and it turns them on mm -hmm. in a variety of ways, right? Mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. And much of therapy, much of trauma release work, much of work in the addiction community is centered around trying to do two things. One is to create new rewards that are associated with healthy behaviors. Right. I mean, 12 Steps is a really good example where the community aspect is a big part of it, trying to create those bonds. Yes. An attachment to be new behaviors to try and pull that 
reward circuitry toward healthier things that and are less adaptive. less tacky... No, less tacky kinin. Less tacky kinin. Less tacky kinin. If you're, if you're, just think tacky bad. So less yeah, tacky so kinin. much of right. it is about uh, fellowship and making emotional bonds and not isolating. That's, right. That's a really big part of what why twelve step works. Right, and move us away from. I mean, for an addict, and now I'm lumping addiction to this, but for an addict whose life is going down the tubes, or mm -hmm. spent all their money, has lost their job, has lost their family, and they continue to want to use. Yeah. It's clear that the reward pathway has been linked to something that's maladaptive. Now, I realize as I'm saying this that, and people are, some people are probably thinking, this is just a lot of neuro speak for what we already know, but there's an important operational or kind of verb element in this, not just naming things, but putting verb tenses on it, which is if you want to build new healthy reward circuitry in any domain of life, relationships or related to drug behavior or avoiding drug behavior is, is, is what I'm referring to. It's very important that there's a behavior involved in moving away, in creating new forms of rewarding things. This is why it's not sufficient to just sit there yes. and you need, a, you need a carrot and a stick. You need to push off the destructive behavior mm -hmm. and you need to create new intense rewards right maybe as intense rewards for Taking the health reaction. Right. So it can't be gratitude or cocaine. So let me ask it's you gotta be gratitude as a, as the, the competitor uh -huh. for cocaine addiction. Mm -hmm. But it's not just gonna be gratitude because gratitude is never gonna have that kind of intense dopamine release. It's gonna have to be gratitude, community, job, pursuit of new things that are exciting. There has to be a mode of excitement mm -hmm. attached to the thing that you want. It can't just be passive for the good stuff and active. Well, it's like for the wanting bad to go to. It's like you know, changing your brain is the same as going to the gym. You you can't just want to change your body without going to the gym. You can't want to change right. your brain without actually um, having the reward, right? So it's it's is a example, although not perfect, maybe in. Uh, when you get sober after 30 days, you get a chip, you know, and then you get a reward and then you get a cake. And then it's a big part of it. It's baked into the, um, to those communities. I've spent some time in ad addiction treatment and if trauma release communities. If you want to take a slip of water, please go for it. What did I open that? No, I, I saw you wanting to take what we a call a fixed action pattern involves the brain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a subset of neurons in the rhombus. You're, <laughs> you're just taking a drink of water. Can we just keep yeah. it simple? <laughs> um, <laughs> thirst isn't, no, I'm uh, the, uh, but I yeah so do it's, you it's, fight with women when you date them? I've never been in a fight with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens? They Is it a nightmare? Uh, what's your main? What's I'm, the main feedback you get? The main f like, feedback that I get. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this got really personal. <laughs> like our girls about, like, about what? Just like oh, so you don't fucking care? Oh, I feel like you get that. Um, can I think about this? <laughs> Yes, that's so smart. Can I think about that and go for a walk and get back to you? Or how about this? I hear you. I'm going to think about what you just said. Oh um, my God. And, Never say I hear you. <laughs> Never say I hear you. I, I I'm what, triggered. There's, so there's I an, feel cornered. There's a neurobiological rule, which is that whatever somebody says under these conditions will be the wrong thing. So I'm just going <laughs> to say nothing. Well, I do know Harville Hendricks says that uh, the way to communicate if you can't if, if what the person is saying, you're just not hearing, you're supposed to repeat what the other person right. says, right? Mm -hmm. So I hear that you're uncomfortable and didn't it didn't land well with you that I came home at two in the morning, but I feel, you know what I mean? Right. And you have to say, I feel like this is happening, not you're doing this fucking thing. You have to say, I feel like you're doing this fucking thing. Right. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> you really do not take the bait. You really walk well. There, the there's certain. I mean, I just. I'll, I'm impressed. As you, the reason I bring it up is because I think a lot of us are triggered by calmness. A lot of us are triggered by not getting an emotional reaction out of people because we equate it with not being loved or being emotionally abandoned or the, you know we project like you said mm -hmm. before. So if you're just like calmly listening to someone, it could be like, oh, so you don't fucking care. Oh, you know. I think it's just fascinating to and talking about reading faces. A lot of us project onto faces. You know, you might be reading them wrong you might be <laughs> half of the time we don't even know what we think about ourselves and yes. feel about ourselves how in the world are we expected to know what other people think yes. and you know the world is devoid of any language that's adequate at explaining our feelings at a really core level mm. I, I just don't think that you know songs are much better at you know, conveying a sense of emotion than words are in their kind of written form. Although there's some great poetry and books that will do that. Mm -hmm. But when someone wants to articulate how they feel and have the other person really understand, that's a, that's a tough one. So this is why I think animals are wonderful because yeah. we can, if we can 
adjust, we can actually start to feel things at a more visceral level. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget where we were a moment ago, but I'll just use this as an opportunity to say um, that diaphragm thing that we were talking about before, I'm not circling all the way back without intention here. Um, I've been spending some time with opera singers and talking to them. They actually can control their emotions, not just through voice, but through the reverberation frequency of their diaphragm. They talk about this. They can bring themselves to tears or to elation. And that's because the neurons that control that sighing, double inhale, exhale, and the diaphragm are sitting cheek to jowl with the neurons that control laughing, coughing. There's a really interesting study of called locked in syndrome. These are people that have, My remember that diving bell and the butterfly, is that the yeah. name of the movie? Yeah. I haven't seen it, but that's, I think the movie that describes locked this. Locked in, as in like you're locked in. Right. These people can't do anything except blink. They're yeah. paralyzed. And they've looked at breathing in these people. And there's a, a famous, and this is written in a, in a scientific paper, a case study paper, but a scientific paper nonetheless, of somebody with locked in syndrome and they're measuring their breathing. And then their breathing suddenly changes. Mm. And then they ask the person, wait, what happened? Mm. And they said, oh, um, you made a joke. I laughed. <gasps> and so the breathing, yeah. our breathing is also very connected to our emotional states. It's yeah. not just about calm, alert. It's also about happy, sad. It's yeah. about funny. It's about, I think I'm choking. That's also an alert signal. So the diaphragm is very important. You asked earlier, and I want to make sure that I answer your question about um, breathing with the ribs, the chest yeah. versus breathing from the belly. Here's the deal. Mammals have a diaphragm so they can bring more oxygen into the lungs because they tend to have bigger brains than non-mammals. So reptiles will sit there. They only breathe with the muscles between yeah, their ribs. Yeah, yeah. We have both. We can breathe with our diaphragm or with our ribs. The whole concept that your belly has to extend when you breathe in and contract when you breathe out. Sorry, folks, not true. What? The whole system was wired so you could, I can inhale and bring my belly in or I can do it this way, either way. And I don't have any kind of like weird yogic whatever control. It was designed to work any which way. And there's now kind of a movement in the athletic performance and movement community of mm -hmm. saying, oh, you know, belly breathing is bad. I'm belly breathing isn't community. bad. <laughs> belly breathing isn't good. Sometimes you need to breathe with your ribs. When you run really hard, you're gonna breathe with your ribs and yeah. diaphragm. So there's a lot of kind of like garbage out there about you only use 10% of your brain. It's like, who came up with that one? And if you use your 100% of your brain, you'd be, you have a, it's called a seizure, you know, or we can't multitask. We can't, I would avoid any um, blanket statements yeah. like that. But anyway, Weighted if you're breathing, statements. wait, <laughs> I love a good pun. S scientists are pretty nerdy. We like, we like. Yeah, I thought you but, like So that. breathing with your ribs is fine. But the more that you can engage the diaphragm, the more oxygen you can bring into your system. But in any event, I, I just want to make sure that we um, you know, tied those up because I remember they came Am I allowed to go on another tangent? You know podcasts are just tangent after tangent after tangent. I know. It keeps your coming. Brain, I mean, you're, you're, yeah. no, you're, you're, an you're an Australian shepherd. You keep wanting to hurt Oh, no. That's back. my least favorite breed. <laughs> No. <laughs> you want to keep things organized. No, I, I uh, spent some time on the beach this morning with my dog and the, the, um, there was an Aussie shepherd out there. It would like go and turn around and look at us. Costello was my bulldog. He was looking at me like, what is yeah. that animal? Like that, that's totally foreign. And you know, and for everybody listening, they know like my love of my life, uh, uh, sort of passion breed are pit bulls who have this reputation for being, you know, truculent and uh, pugnacious. And so for the, on the same token, I'll say that, Huskies do need to run and they do have a certain amount of exercise they need to get and they are very high energy. Um, obviously, they, you know, need a certain temperature because of their coat. They've evolved to do a certain thing. But there are so many stereotypes that are incorrect about um, these as well on the same token, mm -hmm. um, because so much of it is nurture in terms of aggression level and stuff. So it's like a pit bull, yes, is bred to do the maximum amount of damage if the nurture has been abuse, mm -hmm. but it is not what they're inherently bred to do. They're actually um, nanny dogs. They're actually bred to watch they're children. Kids. Yeah, they're amazing Often. with kids. Yeah. When their nurture is negative, they can do the maximum amount of damage. I lost an ear, like, I, I, I yeah, I, my ear was bitten off. It was sewed back on. Wow, Yeah. by a pit bull? Yeah, by a, by a mix. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and there's no such thing as pit bull. It's like pit bull is also sure, it's many. A terrier. Yeah, it's so, a, yeah. So, I'm also nomenclature like in this area is so important because there's such mm -hmm. a negative association of the word pit bull. Like, um, to what you were saying before, certain words like can just, you know, trigger people's fear and amygdala so quickly. So, we say staffy, we say pity, stuff like that, trying to sort of change the association with it. Um, but I do want to go a tangent on about some things that served us really well 
in the past uh, as as humans, and we know they did because we our reward system was activated. We get serotonin or dopamine. Things like one of the biggest fights I get in in relationships is that I want to pop zits. I'm popping all Just your zits. Ra- all- I'm popping all your zits. Mine? Yes, um, all your zits. You've never had a girl do that. Uh, no, there are. It seems to be a consistent theme <laughs> like, in, rela- you. in relationships that, um, and people have these picking things, right? I mean, there's some people, there are- Every girl um, I know has to, I have to tweeze your ingrown hairs, I have to tweeze your eyebrows, and I have to pop your zits. It is actually, like, to me, it's- it's. Well, we're primates. It's totally, but we get, uh, I was going to say something kind of dirty, and I restrained myself um, for you, but I- you know, it's something that now seems annoying and naggy and perfectionistic and nitpicky, but in the past, that's something that served us really, really well, right? Well, Gro- I think it does grooming. still now. I think that um, it's about removing infection from the body. Mm-hmm. I think if you look at primate species, mm-hmm. they groom each other. And we get and, serotonin from it, right? Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not aware of any specific study When I on pop that. a zit, it's, I, I, it's like an orgasm for me. <laughs> So maybe this is like a foot fetish. Oh my god, I have a fetish. <laughs> I mean, there there's a substantial community online. Have you ever picked an ingrown hair with a tweezer? Nothing I, feels better. I, I don't. I don't think I own a tweezer. <laughs> what? We have them in the lab, but you I would look never so use well them. Groomed. Um, look, I have one of these. This is nose hair clippers. I have. That them looks all. like a taser. Yeah. <laughs> they manscaped. We got to get you some merch. Um, I think. Behaviors that remove infection from the body Mm. are adaptive behaviors. And I think there's, with adaptive behaviors, there's always going to be two components. We already talked about them earlier. One is a kind of aversion for something like, we got to get that out. We got to get away from it. If I I see a a zit on someone that I'm dating or like a whitehead or a pimple or a blackhead or something, it's all I can think about. I have to get it. So it's a strong evolutionary drive there. Makes sense to get out infection from the body. And then there's... It sounds like for you in particular, there's a, re- to get it. there's a reward. You, the, in, you, in your you're case, used to this, a, In right? your case, a significant reward yeah. from the feeling that it is now ejected from the body. I've even done it with exes. You know, <laughs> I'll be hanging out with an ex and I'll be like, can I just get that? <laughs> they're like, fuck, we're not together anymore. This is weird. Um, I don't know where the boundaries lie <laughs> uh, uh, for, for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but have you had women do that to you? Yes. <laughs> Okay, yes. but you see how yeah. like it's so uncontrollable. But it's even like, We're not like I'll give a more benign non-sexual example. It's like a guy with porn. Yeah. There's no get in between. Well, it's like you know I have an older sister. I'm a younger brother, and she would she used to say things like like Oh, I have to do this to your. I have to pluck your eyebrows, have or you got to do this thing, or have you have to. Do to do I'm it. like, yeah, I don't have to do anything. She's like, I want to. She it seemed like there was like a strong drive. There's no to do getting this. between it's, me and a blackhead. It's right, an obsession, and right. then after I do it, I think about it. So like I replay yeah. in my head. And, and there are, and I, and I swear, <laughs> I, like don't, my spank I don't watch these, but I, you know, there's a, YouTube is a very interesting portal into the Psychosis. human psyche, mm-hmm. right? I mean, why is it that a movie of a shark attack gets, you know, 40 million views mm. and a lecture from the wor- a world expert on kind of the history Bill of Gates, viruses. Five years ago, saying a pandemic was coming, no one cared. But, but, right. I mean, the, you know, you look at the, there's, the more limbic something is, the more Mm. it engages the hypothalamus and these areas of the brain that are related to either appetitive, the things we want to pursue Mm. or aversive behaviors or both Mm. in the, the more people are going to want to engage in those behaviors. And And I think in something you're saying, I think explains a lot of what's going on when we're all, we're all so confounded by Twitter mobs. We're confounded by cancel culture. Uh, Sorry. Twitter mob. I have a Twitter account, but I don't go on there much. I'm not, I'm not active on Twitter. Uh, Instagram. (laughs) Yes. I can ask, but not Twitter. But what is a Twitter mob? Twitter mob. mob, Like when someone, um, an old tweet resurfaces that was offensive or problematic. And then Twitter jumps on everyone, uh, uh, sort of, gets in their self-righteous indignation and superiority complexes and fuck this person, cancel this person. There's some um, uh, a trending hashtag of so-and-so is over party. Hashtag Whitney is over party. And to me, it, it it's a feeding frenzy. It's a Twitter mob where they're piling on one person. Primitive, very primitive it's, behavior. It's it's almost like the talent. Well, it's evolved behavior because it's on the computer, but it's very, pr- the, the underpinnings of it are very primitive. Primitive. Yeah. And, and it isn't it basically, I equate it to our modern day Rome Coliseum, you know? Well, and it's- we 
We've um, always done this in some way. I mean, what's kind of eerie is that, so there was a paper published in a very high quality journal this last year in a cell press journal, um, which is a very high qu quality journal house, um, showing that beliefs are actually attached to the reward system, to the dopamine system. So when people see evidence of something they already believe, mm. it's, it's like a dope, it's like a drug hit for them. It con the confirmation bias goes way beyond just, I see more of what I expect or more I of knew what I it. believe. Beliefs actually have their own intrinsic reward. And people out there saying, oh, well, of course that makes, of course it does. But no, this is actually means that you're reinforcing beliefs through a chemical system that leads you to see that your beliefs are actually more chemically powerful to you than other people's beliefs. Even if it's not true. So if I right. believe the earth is flat and I go on Facebook and I see someone saying the earth is flat, I get a hit of dopamine. What is the biological basis for that? Like, why would we have needed that in the past? Well, I mean, our, you know, and I'm not an expert in human evolutionary behavior at the level of culture where I know a thing or First of all, no one really understands evolutionary biology. All you evolutionary biologists out there and <laughs> neuroscientists, I hate to tell you, there is no fossil record of neural circuits. Wow. There, there are skulls, but those wow. skulls are empty. So this is one of the big challenges of understanding our own evolution wow. is that there's no fossil record of neurology. All those skulls sit empty. So we have to look at body form and skull shape and infer what the underlying neural circuitry was. So when someone tells me, oh, you know, um, evolutionarily this makes sense i i'm on board because there's a logic there mm -hmm. but when they tell me oh the the circuits were once like this and then like there's no fossil record yeah, so because it all decays and you just get the skull and the skeleton and the body plan now that can tell you a lot but we could imagine or hypothesize that we needed to exist in groups mm -hmm. to develop tools that were beyond the physical capacity of any one person to develop cultures a lot of our brain structure is socio-biological and when people agree in groups, mm -hmm. there's great strength to that. There's Even great, if they're wrong. Well, and when, you, when you're a dissenter, you are actually taking yourself out of the resource pool. Yes, you're right? ostracized. It's, you're less likely to be right. protected. And, it's, and it, at, a, at a core level, it's resources, mm -hmm. right? It's the, you know, we are, not everything is being, is driven to reproduce. You know, some people, including myself, don't have kids, et cetera. But evolution is about the offspring it is not about the parents like it doesn't care evolution doesn't have a mind it doesn't care about us it cares about the next generation mm -hmm. the next generation the next generation it's we're we're wired to propagate mm -hmm. mostly and to secure the safety and well-being of the offspring that's not an excuse if you've cheated no in fact hey, right. dr huberman told me we're right. wired to propagate i'm definitely not i definitely <laughs> don't want to meddle in anyone's relationships or or behaviors right i mean today it's just the neuroscience lens on these things because that that's what there. we do all day we're kind of just playing whack-a-mole with our reptilian brains and our primordial instincts right? right and the threshold for typing something out online is much lower than the threshold for actually having to go and have a conversation with somebody face to face be confrontational um, yeah, the, so I didn't know about these Twitter mobs. Do they exist on other social Twitter platforms? Twitter mobs are like, have you like have you heard um, of like people that got canceled? Yeah, no, I, it makes sense. But do they? Is it only on Twitter or do they exist? It's not also? only on Twitter. I mean, like Facebook. It's sort of like a and, it's it's a pile on. It's basically people. And to me, it it so clearly feels like addictive behavior, like this adrenaline dopamine hit. Of we're yeah. all going to like pile on this person, and you know, I think there's this subconscious. Tell me if I'm wrong from a scientific perspective of like of like the same way when you see um, a car wreck or something, like you have this need to look and see what happens because it's our way of figuring out, you know, at least in terms of, you know, what's in the zeitgeist and what's problematic and what's not of like, it's our way of studying what's appropriate and what's not and where the boundaries are and what we're allowed to say and not allowed to say. Sure. And it's our way of going, that person's guilty, we must be safe. Right, and the threshold keeps getting higher. If you see a horror movie that's really, really extreme, Movies that you've seen previously that were really thrilling to you won't seem as thrilling anymore. Mm, yeah. Right? So unless you're a real Hitchcock fan or you're really into kind of the, mm -hmm. the slow burn of a Hitchcock movie, if you see something that's really intense visual yeah. horror, the Hitchcock thing isn't going to seem scary. Yeah. It's just the way that our dopamine system is wired is it wants to go for higher and higher thresholds. There's a name for it, which is dopamine reward prediction error. You can look it up if you want. But basically, you anticipate the, the intense pleasure that is has an element of surprise and novelty. Mm. So I think also people are seeking novelty. It's very easy to find online. I think most people are familiar with the experience of waking up, looking at their Instagram feed or other thing on, on a screen, doesn't matter if it's Instagram or not, 
and not even knowing why you're there. Yeah. Why, are you are you seeking reward? Are you Ugh, seeking to punish like someone? Habit. And the the I think the short answer is most people are not there for any specific reason. Mm. It's that it's tapping into a great number of these neurochemical systems, and we've now passed it from learned to reflexive, which is what the nervous system wants to do. And is that part of building up a tolerance? Is that is yeah. that in late? We're seeking terms? more dopamine. We're seeking we don't even know what we're seeking. Yeah. But we're seeking at the, it's at so the end mindless. of the day. That's right. It's mindless. That it's mindless. It's mental chewing gum that has, there's no nutritional value at the end point. Now, there are elements of social media. I teach neuroscience on social media. So I'm, I'm there. there What's are, happening? How bad is it? The, the, my teaching on social no. media? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask, you have to ask somebody else. Um, there are I'm no teaching. Go on Reddit well, right I used, there used to be teaching evaluations <laughs> out there. And, um, and don't do that anymore. They do. There, there is rate my professor. Mm, like um, zag it for professor. Yeah, and there, those are out there. I think um, that's not as popular anymore. Mm. That was a few years back. But. No, I mean, like, how bad? Like, what's the bottom line? Because I hear rehabs are opening for social media and phones. Sorry. Oh, that. Like, how, how bad is it to well, to search online? Top just, line. Like, how bad is our addiction to social media? How bad is this for our brains? I know that's I think, a huge I think question. You, I think people ought to consider why they're there, mm -hmm. and I do think that our the amount of time spent on the phone and searching other people's content is inversely related to our own creativity and productivity. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I don't use these things, I do, but great creative works have not come from scrolling feeds. However, ideas, interactions, mm -hmm. getting to know people in different communities, there, there's some wonderful things about social media right, too. Right. We just have to be very, very deliberate and very, very conscious of how we're using it. And I think that, you know, in, in something, the way that you define addiction, I believe is a narrowing of things that bring you pleasure. I define addiction as a through the lens of neuroscience, I define addiction as a progressive narrowing mm -hmm. of the things that bring you pleasure. Mm -hmm. And dare I say, I define enlightenment as a progressive expansion of the things that bring you pleasure. Nice. I don't know what it means to be enlightened, but right. I know that the more things that can bring me pleasure, the happier and more enlightened I feel, whatever that means. And that's purely subjective. And no, that's not a double blind peer reviewed controlled study in my laboratory. That's my experience. The addiction thing is definitely rooted in a lot of neurobiological studies, which show that as people get addicted, the source of dopamine mm -hmm. starts to narrow and narrow right. and narrow to just the exact thing. And in certain, with certain drugs like cocaine and amphetamine in particular, they chemically are almost identical to dopamine. Mm. Not identical, but they're yeah. similar enough. So you're now they're literally ingesting the molecule that you're used to use behaviors to release in your mind. Well, I do think it's people who wonder, like, is am I addicted to my phone? Am I addicted to social media? I think a lot of people, uh, you know, ask me, I'm not an expert, but like, I can't tell if I'm an addict or not. I can't tell if this is a healthy amount or health. I think the, the I love saying these definitions because it will help you understand, like, if there's a problem and number one, what, you know, what to do with it, which is another definition that I love is, um, to continue to do something despite negative consequences. Right. Like every day you're going, oh fuck, I just wasted another six hours on social media. The next day you find yourself, oh, my screen time's six hours again. You just keep doing the right. same. How did I do this? Why did I do this? I'll try a different definition. Uh, the one that I think of is, look, can I be addicted to water? Sure, but it takes a lot of water drinking mm. before the baseline of my life starts to go down. Yeah. So I think of all behaviors as they're either baseline neutral, meaning my job, my social connections, my finances, et cetera, are neutral. It doesn't change them. There are behaviors that improve my social connections, my occupational goals, my it, everything. Mm -hmm. And then there are behaviors that will drive the baseline on your life down very fast, like heroin mm -hmm. is a good example. Yeah. Massive opioid release and dopamine release in the brain. People's lives fall apart almost every single time quickly, Yeah, right? It's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So everyone can agree, heroin is very addictive. Water is not very addictive. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by that? Well, there are people that I know that have to drink a lot of water and they have to drink a certain kind of water and et cetera. Well, if they're doing that- Person and the, sounds really annoying. <laughs> yeah, well, those- the, <laughs> those, peach, those They're not super abundant in today's society, but um, there are a lot of behaviors that are annoying, invasive, high maintenance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You hear this kind of language, but the baseline on their life isn't changing. They're still good parents. They're still good partners. Oh, yeah, yeah. They can still They're function. still happy inside. So I think if you're asking the question, am I addicted to my phone or phone behavior? The question is, well, is your job suffering? Mm -hmm. How much? Are your social interactions suffering? I would say, you know, it used to be that when people would come out of surgery, they would reach first for their genitalia. This is a well-described phenomenon in the uh, surgical world, 
right? I'm not a surgeon, but friends who are surgeons, like it's totally true. People come out of anesthesia and the first oh, thing they do- Okay, not the, I they, thought you meant the surgeon. No. <laughs> Leaves his I'm not a surgeon, but <laughs> no, I'm the, I'm going the, to assume no. The patient, the, got the it. patient, like kind of reaches for these their reproductive organs, like safety. It's like of their bite. Now, yeah. they reach for their phone. <gasps> they're, yeah. So, is that a lowering of the baseline in their life? Probably not. Does it interfere with life? But it it speaks to the like really deep and kind of primal level that these devices are starting to. Occupy. I mean, I don't want to demonize the phone, but I will say this. I think we also equate them with safety. That's the other thing that when people slam phones and you're addicted to your phone, it's also it's like, but I also carry this around when I leave the house and I feel safer knowing I can make sure. a phone call. You know what I mean? It's sort of like the fact that we used to leave the house without phones is so wild to me. And that's the time where I'm like, ah, I'm not going to over pathologize this. Like it makes me feel safe. Right. There are elements within the phone and even just the physical architecture of the yeah. phone because we're not in panoramic vision. We're looking into this little box mm -hmm. that are increasing stress. But I also understand that being away from the phone is very stressful. For yeah, people. yeah, yeah. So, you know. It's weird. That, I mean, it's also it's so funny because I, I was... Um, you know, uh, thinking about this the other day of the phone, I'm thinking about getting a camera because I realized so much of my phone is the camera. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not really addicted to texting and emailing. Like I hate that shit. But to me, it's when I go somewhere, I have an addiction to documenting things and like, I need to get a photo of this, you know? Right. Uh, it's almost like I'm addicted to taking photos of things, which might be more my fear of missing out or my fear of forgetting something or my fear of not having proof of something. Or, or you just like photos. I just like photos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me overthink this. Um, there are so many things that I'm have, we have not gotten to, so I'm going to jump around like crazy sure. because something we didn't mention around the fear and anxiety thing and the being attracted to people that cause you ostensible stress or, you know, I think there's been, you know, I think this is why words are just so important. I think that fear and anxiety have been romanticized a lot in, you know, movies, whatever, books, in relationships where when you meet someone and you feel butterflies or you feel we've, I think been taught to conflate fear or anxiety with like passion, you know, like what from your perspective, what are butterflies when you meet someone? Is that your body telling you to turn the fuck around or is that your body telling you like this is your soulmate? Cause sometimes I think our bodies send us signals and we've uh, changed what they mean because of like romance novels and mute songs and whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, broadly speaking, and I want to just be clear that this is, I know I'm using kind of a broad <laughs> contour. I'm not getting down in the weeds of this. Alertness and what we call autonomic arousal or just kind of arousal and alertness, mm -hmm. which is adrenaline on its own mm -hmm. is generally negative. It's designed to get us to move away from If you things. feel butterflies, is that a pit in your stomach telling you this person's dangerous? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that in a second. <laughs> adrenaline and arousal plus dopamine is desire. Hmm. physiologically, they're almost identical at the level of the body, except one has this additional chemical of desire. Shit. The f butterflies are in part, but largely the activation of that phrenic nerve to diaphragm connection. Ooh. That reverberation. This is what opera singers are exceptionally good at bringing into their, into their voice so that you feel what they're saying. If you listen, I'm not a big opera fan, but I've been listening to more of it lately because I've been interacting with these opera singers and there are elements to their vocalizations where you feel something. That's right. I have no idea what they're saying. I don't speak Italian, mm -hmm. but it sounds amazing and you can see it. And if you look at their faces or not, it, it can change things. But so that reverberation, the butterflies is, it's a feeling. Mm. And I think that we should probably all learn, we could all afford to better understand what these reverberations mean. Mm. That those butterflies could be arousal that's meant to say, get out of there. Mm -hmm. Like this is, because remember arousal, adrenaline changes your nervous system, in, which changes your musculature to make you want to move, right? Serotonin yes. changes your nervous system, changes your musculature in a way that makes you want to relax, okay? So... The, but remember, you throw dopamine into the mix mm. and all of a sudden there's intense desire for this thing that's really exciting. Some people love roller coasters for, take two people. Hate them. You know, some people, one, you have a good friend. He spent, you know, 20 plus years in the SEAL teams. Mm -hmm. he, he was a, a CEO, a commanding officer in the SEAL teams. He hates roller coasters. His wife loves them. Okay. So same experience, mm -hmm. same visceral experience. The addition of one molecule, dopamine, changes. Wow. It makes, she likes it. He doesn't. He'll do it because he's a team guy and they, 
he's not going to not do it. Not going to be a bitch. Yeah, exactly. He's going to do it. It doesn't ter- it doesn't terrify him. He just doesn't enjoy it. Yeah. It's unpleasant for him. That's, she loves it. That's what it's like for me. I'm right. just like, when is this going to be over? When is this exactly. going to be over? But f- so I think that most people should have some sort of practice, either maybe through well-guided therapy or maybe just through a sense of intuition of learning to read these signals. As we talked about in an earlier conversation offline, you know, animals are exceptionally good at understanding what these signals from their body Mm -hmm. mean. Humans are still speculating about it. And I don't have all the answers. There's great books like The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah, great book. Vanderbilt. I can never pronounce his name. The Dutch, goodness. Tough name. The Body Keeps the Score. Great book. Forgive me for butchering the name. But there are body signals that are positive right? There are body signals that are negative and learning to distinguish those mm-hmm. and including the mind. It's not body only. A lot of people kind of take in this, the body keeps the score to mean that it's the only source of information for the nervous system. That's as stupid as saying, you know, the brain is the only thing that matters, right? It's brain and body. Right. And so I think that people learning to how these things connect for them is going to be important. Some people are more embodied. They're more in touch with the brain body connection than others. And some people are really out of their body and could benefit from somatic type therapies. Some people are really in their bodies. And then you talk to them. A lot of extreme creatives are like this, Mm -hmm. where you talk to them and they're kind of all over their place. It's like they're non-linear all the time. Yeah. I won't name names because I don't know these people and I actually really love their art and music. But I hear some interviews with some creative musicians. I'm like, they it's like two plus two equals nine for them, two plus, you know, and it's cool because it allows them to reorganize elements in ways that are creative, that are new and different. Whereas you talk to somebody who's an engineer or has a math background or a science background, mm-hmm. and they're always striving for linearity. They're, you always said, you know, I'm like that, whatever that, yeah, you were is doing that I this, can't yes, even yes. say because I don't like <laughs> the <laughs> always trying to get create structure. Mm-hmm. So these are two different aspects of the mind, and I think. There's nothing wrong with butterflies, but you have to ask yourself, are these butterflies of attraction or butterflies of like, this person makes me fearful. Yeah. And for the people that say this person makes me fearful and I like it. Yeah. You should do a little bit of therapy before you get involved, (laughs) but, or do therapy together. Like, again, I'm not a psychologist, but I think that the questions that you're asking, what I love about them is they're getting to the core elements of this push pull in biology, vomit, chocolate chip cookies right? Mm -hmm. Feces, clean, crisp water when you're thirsty. Yeah. Right. The reason I'm using these kind of extreme examples is these are hardwired circuits. And then you think about relationship with somebody that's destructive for us Mm -hmm. versus relationship with somebody that's really nurturing. But wait, why are people getting pulled this way? Well, clearly there hasn't been enough introspection and linking of the mind body connection Mm -hmm. to figure out maybe their physical arousal is tied to something that cognitively is unhealthy for them. Yes. My twenties. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you yeah. do know how to bite your tongue, which I do appreciate. I learned that the um, through a lot of uh, failures. A lot of lobotomies you gave yourself. I only have one lobotomy. No, I'm kidding. I, as far as I know, I don't have any lobotomies. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a bunch of like quick questions because I have so many more. And I'm She's gonna... asking me to be succinct. I'm literally, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm Will not it... going to let you go until I'm. I don't let people I, go. I'm happy to talk in. neuroscience. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Do you even have Wi Fi? <laughs> I didn't give you the code. I'm happy you to can't talk neuroscience you until to. you tap out. I want so. to. Uh, why does it feel so fucking good when I organize shit? That is a primordial instinct. I'm just trying to depathologize a lot of behaviors that drive people crazy in relationships. Get your fucking mm-hmm. wet towel off. The bed. I like I can't handle a wet towel on the bed. Will you just that answer nature or nurture? <laughs> will you just answer the question I was about to ask, which was not because you said I love organizing stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I was going to ask, how much does it bother you when things are disorganized? And I think you answered it with the towel. Yeah, I thing. just it's fun. And I don't and two things happen. Number one, I get you know, I I grew up without money so i i have a scarcity complex and i and i really respect things i'm not materialistic but i respect things i i value them i i I cherish them because i didn't get a lot of things growing up so i'm sure there's a little bit of nurture involved and like i bought this thing or fucking benton drives me nuts because he'll walk in with wet feet on the wooden floor there's certain things that drive me absolutely nuts but i'm also a horse girl and i'm fine being covered in dirt and shit and i'll pick up dog like i don't i'm very I'm not precious about that kind of stuff. I'm fine with bugs and spiders. But like disrespecting things really bothers me. And the fact that I just said I need organization and this desk looks like a fucking yard sale is going to make me seem like I'm a pathological liar. But I can't I can't tell if it's I feel disrespected or I need the organization. I just like 
I'm more calm when things are organized. And if I'm stressed out, organization is the number one thing that calms me down. Not a massage, not a, you know, just if I can just go organize the bookshelf, I'll be okay. Hmm. Maybe okay. it's productivity and cooperation make dopamine and I'm just yeah, a false so, sense of control. Um, I'll ask you a question and I think it'll answer your question. Okay. Your answer will answer the question. Uh -oh. You have a lot of experience working with animals. Yeah. Do animals organize their space? Yes. There you go. It's adaptive. Maybe that's not the answer you want. They I don't could, organize my space. Do, do you want me to, well, They right. make a mess wouldn't of that, my Wouldn't shit. that be wonderful? Yeah. Um, you know, they do it to varying degrees, but again, it gets back to this um, acne popping, zit popping thing. Organization mm -hmm. is predictability. Yes. And it frees up brain space for other operations. So perhaps I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but in addition to doing interoception, exteroception, inside, outside analysis of real estate, in, uh, et cetera, all that stuff, the brain wants to learn things and then pass it off to reflexive behaviors so that it can learn more things. Mm. Horses are really good at what horses do. Yeah. Diving birds are really good at what diving birds do. Animals are specialists. The human animal has a nervous system and brain that is really good at learning things and loves to learn things. Some people more than others. But when we learn, we're analyzing three things. Duration, how long something's going to take. Path, what path should it take. Outcome, when you write your comedy routines, mm -hmm. you think those up, you're thinking duration, path, and outcome. It's a very creative, iterative process, very particular to you. But once you learn how to do something, you pass it off to reflexive behavior. You don't have to think about how to walk down the hall because right. you learned that when you Auto were this pilot. big. Yeah. So organizing things frees up mental space so that you can be devoted to duration, path, and outcome analyses mm. of the things that are important to you. Now, we all know people that can tolerate a mess, okay? Yeah. My postdoc advisor, uh, I know I've been talking about him recently to you offline, and Ben Barris, who has incredible mind, just brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. His office was a wreck. <laughs> Literally, piles of papers. My graduate advisor, brilliant mind, incredible human being. Her office was a sty. I sometimes would walk in there, I couldn't see her. Now, these are two highly accomplished neurology neurologists, MD, PhDs. One was and the other was just a PhD, but MD, PhDs. Members of the National Academy of Sciences. One had a family, was very functional in the family life. The other was a pure scientist. But I mean, I'm talking high, high functioning people. But they had one thing in common. They didn't see mess. They literally, I'd say, I, I'd walk in there and I'm like, Ben, how can you work like this? And he was just like, don't touch anything because I won't be able to find it. This is my and organized I'm like, mess. I'm like, how can you find anything? I can't even find you. Yeah. You know, he's buying this wall of papers. So his mind was very narrowly tuned to just a couple things in life. He had tremendous concern for a couple narrow bands of attention. And he was a little different. He was a little bit on the kind of, he was not autistic or Asperger's. He had a lot of, you know, sensitivity actually and interpersonal sensitivity, but he couldn't recognize faces. Mm -hmm. He had a face, face recognition Blinders. deficit. He, you know, he was different. He didn't see the mess. If you see the mess like you would, you wouldn't have been able to go into their office. You would have just been like, there are this, people that just you know, don't see mess. They don't see it. But if you do, it's hard to do anything else until that's in its place. So I would say it's adaptive. If it gets to the point where the baseline in your life is going down, mm -hmm. Right, people who are cleaning and cleaning and cleaning all right, the time, right, right. just like hoarding is terrible yeah. for the baseline on life. Cleaning constantly. We say if it's making your life unmanageable. Right. If your job. I'm and, running 20 minutes right. late. If I'm it's clean. harming great yeah. relation, what yeah. would otherwise it be might great have. relationships. I might have. I might have blown up a couple of relationships because of a pair of shoes that were left in a like place. Like one was slightly yeah, off like angle <laughs> from the other. <laughs> like, I saw a scuff on the shoe, and that was it. Yeah. So, so I would say it's adaptive because we see. You're starting to get a glimpse into the way I think about things because we see evidence of it in other species that we share neurology with. Humans are different. We have brain areas that are different, but all animals have brain areas that control our breathing. All animals have brain areas that control our heartbeat. All brain areas have, have brain areas that control wanting to get infection out. Mm -hmm. Monkeys lick and pick. Yep. Humans lick and pick. And when you say adaptive, like to me, a synonym is like, I got this honestly. 
I'm not crazy. I'm not a psycho. Yeah. I've been brilliantly, I've evolved to do this thing, and it's why our species proliferated. This is what it's like to fight with me. <laughs> I go, this is how I'm wired. <laughs> it's not my fault. There's like, like the train left the station a very long time right. ago in terms of this. And it would be very uncomfortable for you to try and rewire this. And it doesn't sound like the baseline on your life is going down as a mm -hmm. consequence. No, no. Your home is very orderly and it's very beautiful. And like, that's something to be proud of. I think, remember the one of Jordan Peterson's thing was like clean your room or something like that. Mm -hmm. One of his like 12 rules to life. And it was a beautiful one because it's so simple, but it's like, put your house in impeccable order. I think that's what that's he right. said. Because to me, it's a little bit like if when your house is a mess, you're a mess. It's like the reflection of, I always I always know what's going on with me based on what my car looks right. like. If I've got a bunch of cans and bottles right. and shit in it, it's like, I'm probably need, right. I have emails to respond to. I have apologies to make. Like it me, it's just it represents everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a whole element, you know, that's related to kind of performance and being in pursuit of goals. I mean, that there's a famous online lecture from Admiral McRaven, former Navy SEAL, about make your bed first thing in the morning. That's right, yeah. And it's always been told, oh, make your bed, because then you know that at least your bed is made when that night, no matter how bad things go. I think that's a minor effect yeah. for most people. The major effect of military life and having a first step that involves something actionable in the world is also one could imagine what you're not doing. You're not lying in bed thinking about all of the things that are tormenting you. Mm -hmm. Being in forward action yeah. also means you're not back on your heels quite as much, yeah. that you're not kind of wavering. So actions and behaviors mm -hmm. send signals back to the nervous system, hunch, posture, yes, but also forward action of any kind sends signals back to your nervous system that you are in control of your environment. So and ultimately animals yeah. want that. The reason your dog or horse can relax mm -hmm. is because it feels like it's in contr enough control is in the environment. It's yeah. sort of the whole pack leader concept with dogs. Mm -hmm. If you don't lead, they will. That's right. Because it makes them anxious if you don't. That's right. People think, oh, they're just really dominant. It's like, no, you're actually not you, but I'm referring to yes. the, the the passive person. You're yes. just too subordinate. They, We all seek, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We all seek these basic levels of autonomic comfort. Mm -hmm. Once we have that, we can think about what's outside our immediate experience and be in pursuit of those goals. It makes people very confused when uh, people ask me about dog training all the time and they're like, well, I don't want to be mean and I don't, it's like, you know, that's your shit. That's your codependent shit. You're projecting some other, like work that out in therapy or whatever. But, you know, the more s clear and stern and dominant you can be with your, with your animal, this doesn't mean abusive. This doesn't mean hurting them or even touching them. But the more clear you are, the safer they actually feel. Absolutely. They feel less anxiety because as you said, like they know you're in charge. Like if you're regal, if you're clear, if you're direct, and if you say what you mean and mean what you say, they feel better mm -hmm. because they know you're going to handle shit. Right. I used to work with some at-risk kids and some non-at-risk kids and it was incredible they were adolescents and young teenagers and it was amazing if we had rules they would resist mm -hmm. but these creative sides and more compatible sides like you know with each other would come out if we didn't have rules they would start doing incredible risk-taking behavior right. and we'd catch kids doing things that were just downright dangerous mm -hmm. so in the same way that animals are craving structure That's like it. structure makes us feel safe i mean there it can be taken too far Right, that maybe the shoe like a little bit off center or whatever is a little <laughs> bit much, but you know, and I, I have, I'm very it proud. It was a high heel, that's why. I'm very proud of having a lab operations manager that is so meticulous. Like our safety, he hits hundreds on our safety inspections. You walk into our lab, you please don't eat off the floor of my lab, but <laughs> but you could. It's like he's that meticulous, and it makes everyone feel great because you feel safe because we work with a lot of dangerous stuff, chemicals yeah. and things like that. Well, so it's, it's like, safety. It's just basic safety. And it's the thing that, I, and I know that I, I probably overthink, you know, you know, I love adages. I love aphorisms. I love generalizations. They make me feel safe, you know, just to be able to throw a, a, a blanket on something every now and then, even though I, I know it's, it's not always helpful or scientifically accurate, but something like the way you do anything is the way you do everything. You know, I tend to go there. Like if I'm in a relationship or a friendship or something, and it's like, if you do this one thing, like, if, you, if we're leaving Starbucks and you leave the coffee cup on the top of the car and we pull out and the coffee spills, it's like, well, what else are you sloppy about? Like, right. if what else are you mindless and thoughtless about? You know, it's it's this hard is... it's hard for me to isolate one incident and not uh, sort of broadly paint my brush of the person's character because my brain goes and maybe this is just a pri primordial thing uh, or my you know biology but it's sort of like okay well so how are you going to parent a child if you can't figure out how to carry a fucking coffee cup like i go i jump that far you know and uh i hope people don't do that <laughs> with me so i try to not do it too much with other people but i uh i i find it difficult to um you know 
uh, not go there, but also there's a famous story about in uh, Green Day on, in their rider for when they did concerts, they would ask for green M&Ms. Like this is sort of um, uh, kind of a legend in entertainment. And if there were green M&Ms at the show, they knew everything else was right. It mm -hmm. means they check the speakers. The Sounds like superstition. Yes, it's like one little thing. Because if you went out of your way to get these green M&Ms, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Now I can trust all the other things you did. So if I, I walk in and the front part of your lab is clean, we now know the speakers are clean. Now, right. see, we're I We're meticulous. Know. That's right. I know yeah, that everything is fine. Yeah. The how you do one thing is how you do everything, and I think is admirable. I It's a little bit, um, I mean, if I may. Extreme. You I, may. Well, I, I, you know... My job requires that I do a few specific things very, very well in order to continue to progress. Yes, 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 right? yes. I have to raise money from my lab. I have to mentor people. I have to oversee the science and build good experiments and make sure that we're meticulous about our analyses, et cetera, conclusions, et cetera. But if I attended to every little detail at, with the level of attention that I do to those things, yes. I would truly never get anything right, done. Right, right, right. So people like my postdoc advisor and my graduate advisor were extremely successful, mm. in particular my postdoc advisor, mostly because he didn't attend to anything else. His home was filled with papers. It was a disaster. Mm. He didn't attend to his nutrition, et cetera. So there are these kind of more lopsided ways of approaching things. But um, I admire people that have the how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. I admire punctual people. Yeah. Um, I you know, we're all reaching to do better. That's the, I hope, I would hope people understand the relationship between how these things reflect a general state of being in the world, that if you're sloppy about one thing, yeah. it's likely that it might carry over. I, that yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I don't know if it's fair or not necessarily. Maybe it's my fear, you know. Do you, is your, do you ever get depressed that Tri you know so much about all this? Depressed. Like, does it ever take the magic out of like the whimsical, I don't know. Life's amazing. Like, <laughs> I, I love life. I just I, like, I mean, are you, are you, I have lows like anyone else or days yeah. I wake up and I'm like, ah, like I'm, I've got too many things coming at me. Yeah. I don't, you know, um, do, I, but I, mean, I don't like, walk around putting a neurobiological lens. But on you know everything. that I, I made a movie about a neurologist who like wouldn't surrender to being in love because she just like reduced it all to neurochemicals. Yeah. And but those neurochemicals <laughs> feel so good. <laughs> It's so true. You know, but right? do you ever like, like, is it hard to be in a relationship? Cause you're just like, oh, this is just me trying to not uh, commit incest and you smell the right way. <laughs> and this is me just trying to propagate and you're producing oxytocin. And, I, don't, like, I don't think about does it. Does it ever way. take, but really? I, think, I think mate choice is a really interesting one. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that. What's the, what's, what's, what is your definition of love? I ask most of the guests this. It would not be a neurobiological one. So there is a, I have a different mode. I'm not in that mode in this moment where I switch my brain to just how things feel. I'm fascinated by, um, I think Robert Greene has written about this, by a kind of a seed of something in childhood that drew us to something. Mm. Like I grew up, I have this absolute affinity at a visceral level to birds, like tropical birds, how animals and how they move. I I mean, when I was a kid, I used to get dropped off at the pet store and I would just like take notes on all the yeah. birds. You see, you know, I was like, I'm fascinated by animals and how they move. I'm fascinated by the natural world. And so for me in that mode, it's all visceral. There's no analysis of it whatsoever. Now I can tell you that the, you know, the elephant has a J-shaped pupil that allows you to, you know, visualize the tip of its trunk better than other things in the environment. I know the underlying biology, dissected a few elephant <laughs> eyes in my days. Elephants that were already deceased from natural causes, <laughs> mind you. But I don't walk around in an analytic mode unless I'm thinking about my work mm -hmm. or how it might, or things I see in the world. Definitely, I look at some of those through a neuroscientific lens. But in general, um, when I'm in an experience, it's just I want to be as purely with that experience and not intellectualizing it at all. But I will say, an intellectual, the word intellectual is badly misunderstood. Mm -hmm. An intellectual, you're an intellectual. <laughs> I, an I inte just feel like fighting with yeah. you is such a right. nightmare. So an intellectual. <laughs> you're like, well, you're actually using that word an wrong. In, <laughs> an, an intellectual is somebody that can appreciate something and knows a lot about it at multiple levels of granularity. Like from a very top contour all the way down to the tiny details. Your understanding of comedy, I mean, we talked about Joe, like his understanding of martial arts is yeah. like, it's amazing, right? Like amazing. it's it's vast, but he's not going to talk about it to me the same way he's going to talk about it to another fighter because he understands it multiple levels of yeah. granularity. I'm going to talk differently among scientists as I do the general public. Yes. So we tend to demonize the word intellectual, but 
part of being having an intellectual orientation in life is knowing when to turn off the analytic side and just being in the experience. Mm -hmm. um, if you want a real and accurate data assessment of how I am in relationship, because that's what you've asked me several <laughs> times now. Um, <laughs> I can give you some. I can give you some references, and you can get there. And no, it's not harassment. You can you can get their assessment. I have been told. I like, want phone number. Yeah, I mean, I want email. Here's what I won't do under any circumstances in any relationship of any kind. I won't be recruited into somebody else's emotional state simply to validate that state. And because you talked about this the other day, is that a called emotional contagion? Yeah, emotional contagion or projection. Like um, there are people that when they feel something they don't like, they have to do what's called evacuative projection. They, yeah. They're angry, they're agitated, so they scream at you. I'm not gonna you. jump on the Titanic right. with you. They scream at you and guess what? Let's say I do that now. Let's just use me as the bad example. Okay. All right, so um, someone in the room says something or you say something to me and I'm angry. Yeah. All right. So then I get all stirred up mm -hmm. and you're calm and it's yeah. upsetting me even when more. When men yell, I start laughing. Right. So, so, so my <laughs> internal, <laughs> so, so my internal metronome is going faster and faster and yours is going slower and it's making me even more angry. Yes. The difference between us, as yeah. I say, the delta for the nerds out there <laughs> is getting greater and greater. So not consciously, but through some sort of learning in childhood, I now scream at you or I say something really cruel. Where I bring you. up some, uh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> now you're triggered. And guess what? I feel calmer. I feel like I got one over on you. I feel, yes. why? Because now we're matched in terms of our level of autonomic arousal. We're both screaming. Right. Now, if you're angry at me and you're screaming at me, let's put you in the bad, okay. bad, bad operator pleasure. position. <laughs> and I'm like, I hear you. Here, exactly exactly so why is that so awful you have to move right, your right, shoulders when right. you do it did i do that you're like i hear you all right well um <laughs> so it's going to be really angering and frustrating to you because i'm not getting I'm, sounds like you're mocking me. i'm not i know you can because you know at an intuitive level i'm not really i might be hearing you with my ears but i'm not really understanding i'm not mm. matching you and humans create crave crave bleh. humans <laughs> crave this matching of like energy. mirroring or something. Yeah. They crave a matching of autonomic arousal, which is really just to say a level of alertness. You know, they, they, we feel comfortable when people are, are in sync same. with us. Yeah. And some of this online, I'm saying this and I'm realizing, and I've been thinking about this for the last few minutes, like some of this online behavior could reflect the fact that people are really frustrated and pissed off and they want other people to be pissed off, frustrated. Right. And it's, they don't even know they're doing it. I think a lot of times this isn't conscious. I'm, specula I'm speculating a lot, but projection is a real thing. Yeah. So, you know, borderline personalities, we have splitting, there's projection, you know, evacuative expression is, is very destructive. It's the kind of thing that it's an attempt to recruit other people. I'm very disappointed with the statement, no one can make us feel anything. That's ridiculous. We can make other people feel things. The idea that you're going to be completely Who walled. Who says that? People say that. Who have you been hanging no, no out with? No one can make you feel anything. No one can make you feel anything. It's ridiculous. The, our, the nervous system integrates what's on the outside. Who says that? Alex People Jones? That. Who are you hanging out I, with? I don't, who's that? <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. That, sorry. <laughs> you, I don't know. You are I don't such know who that an is. alien. I, I, I'm sorry. You don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. This, this is, is the opposite of a red flag. We talk a lot about red flags on the show. No, Alex Jones is like a very alt right, like fake news. Oh, okay. I, I don't get into. I, I yeah, have, he's like I have conspiracy political, theorist. I have political opinions. I just don't voice. Yeah, them no, publicly. neither do. No, neither and, do I. But yeah, it's I just, that to me is such a fake bullshit, fake self help. Like no one can make you feel anything. Like oh yeah, do, no one can hurt you without sure. your consent. Like that's yeah. just like fake. Yeah, there's. It's not grounded wellness. in it. It's not yeah. grounded in any um, reality. That, that you I'm might aware. be a psychopath, right. but that's... Yeah, true. I'll put that with flat earth. Yeah. I'll put that <laughs> with flat earth. not true. Right. But I think it gives people a false sense of empowerment for like ephemeral empowerment. Like, yeah, no one can make me feel anything. But right. then it, you just are going to feel ashamed and disappointed in yourself when right. that it, not ends up being false. I mean, their entire online platforms and people whose entire careers are based on how badly they've been triggered. And I'm not talking traumatized because I have real sensitivity for people that have been legitimately traumatized, but it's all about tri being triggered and triggering other people as a form of emotional contagion and recruitment. The more autonomically aroused people are, the easier it is to recruit them into happiness and joy. Think of yeah. a great concert or into rallying and anger. I mean, this is the, these mechanisms because they're so embedded in our deep neurology have been around for tens of thousands of years and mm -hmm. people are still using them now. They're just using them in slightly more sophisticated ways.
so through the I'm internet. So I'm screaming at you, and you, so what? So either way, you're screwed. If you say I hear you, there's probably it's not gonna go well. well. You gave a good example of a of a an adaptive response. Adaptive meaning good for both people, which was okay. I hear you saying that you're really angry about blank, blank, and blank. Mm -hmm. You're know, like, no, that wasn't articulated exactly the way that I'm thinking. And I'm like, okay, yeah. well, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I think, I think- um, You can say yeah. go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, although some people, this is interesting because I've observed this in uh, trauma release communities. Sometimes when two people are confronting a traumatic thing yeah. and someone says, I, I need a walk, yeah. their leaving triggers the other yes, person. Yeah, feels abandoned. And so this is a whole- there's a whole world of very talented, and I have to say, if there's a community that I've been exposed to that has just tremendous good intentions and 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 you know putting their efforts in the right place, it's this trauma release community. I'm yeah. talking about skilled, qualified, certified people mm -hmm. doing trauma release, trying to bring people to a better relationship with the things that have hurt them and the people that have hurt them. Yeah, it's an incredible community of people making that effort. And humans are just now 2020 trying to figure out how all this works and where neuroscience might play a role. Mm -hmm. um, EMDR changed my life. EMDR, and... breathing. Um, there's just so much happening right now um, that's really exciting. Um, I. It's interesting because I, I have on my list of things to ask you about, like the sort of neurology of schadenfreude, like why we get some kind of sick enjoyment out of other people's embarrassment. You know, is that the German word for like, you know, um, and is that our way of the same way that we get uh, serotonin from gossiping because it helps us, you know, collect information on social mores and like, how we should behave, you know, it's kind of the same. Yeah. When I see somebody not performing well, I feel like really embarrassed. So do I. I do, I do not feel I good. get no. Yeah. But why do we think it's like probably more. Instead of like if a ice skater falls, it's the worst thing. I I I just I can't handle it. I can hardly even watch gymnastics mm -hmm. because if someone falls, it's just like it's it's too upsetting for me. But when someone slips on a banana, it's the if someone falls and doesn't get hurt, there's also nothing funnier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> humor is an interesting one. There's a little bit of neuroscience and and quality cognitive psychology on humor, and humor. Is often just the unexpected thing, yes. or where I feel like the comedian is leading me down a path, and I'm thinking, "Oh no, they're not really going to go there." So it's raising my level of kind of autonomic yeah, sure. arousal, like, "Oh goodness!" And then they might pivot or whatever. I haven't spent a lot of time. Well, now I've spent some time. You know, I did Joe's podcast, and now with you, I think comedians are really interesting because the, they have a they know how to construct linear things. They can build things that are linear, but they also know how to put these these tweaks. They look at the world differently. Mm -hmm. You know, to be creative, you gotta look at the world differently. So I can't really comment too much on what's known because I don't think there's a lot known, yeah. but it is a beautiful example of the creative process mm -hmm. of taking existing elements. I mean, you have the English language for you and you can organize it in ways that are trivial, boring, disappointing, or hilarious based on just the associations with those words. It's really an amazing thing when you think about it. And it speaks to just how powerful the relationship between language and emotions is. I, um, close friend of mine, he's the chair of neurosurgery at UCSF, Eddie Chang, he's a world expert in, in speech and language. And he, he told me about a discovery, um, I think it's from his lab or maybe a neighboring lab. It's kind of interesting that our representation of our hands and hand motion is actually right next to the representation in the brain of speech and language. And this is because humans speak, some people more than others, the Italians in mm -hmm. particular, use their hands to speak. We enunciate and we accentuate with our hands. And so these are primitive forms of expression that have been lumped together. And so I think comedians are, some have a physical comedy, all that. I think it's a vast space. I wish there was more neuroscience on this, mm -hmm. but anyway, it's kind of fun to take a little bit, perhaps what we've t uh, talked about today and just kind of cast that lens on comedy, maybe a discussion for another time. And I think it's important, important for people, stop trying to wrap this up. Uh, I think it's important <laughs> for people to, um, you know, look at, uh, you know, this is going to feel like a weird curveball, but like acting, they say um, great actors, uh, you can tell what they're thinking with the sound off, mm -hmm. you know? So when I think about myself communicating with somebody, if if you took words out of the equation, how would I be coming off to the person? You Because know, sometimes what we say and how we say it contradict each other. And we're like, I don't understand why you think I'm yelling at you. Right. You know, like I'm totally fine. What you're saying and how you're saying it are contradictory. And we're always going to default to how you're saying it, right. not what you're actually saying. You know, it's just so, so much communication being nonverbal. I just feel like there's so much um, distress caused by that uh, 
lack of congruence between what we're saying and how we're saying it and the confusion that it causes in kids seeing my mom is saying she's fine but she seems really stressed out and now I'm doubting my own reality and now I can't trust women and now I'm confused and you know so for me because I grew up in um with very indirect communication all the time it took me a really long time to understand uh to be able to trust mm -hmm. what somebody says. We are very tuned into other people's level of autonomic sort of alertness or calmness. And timbre of voice is one of the most powerful ways that we communicate oh, that. Oh, wow. So it, remember the, the neurons in the brain that control size are right next to the ones that control laughing and crying. An animal crying in pain, sorry to bring up such an oh intense God. example. Start crying. <laughs> yeah, is exactly that you just, you just, just, I don't want to say prove my yeah, point because yeah, yeah. I'm not here to prove points, but you, that response embodies the point I'm trying to make, which is that an animal crying or wailing in pain, a human wailing in pain recruits an emotional state in us. And in the same way, if you grew up in a home where you heard certain kinds of vocalizations that were anger, mm -hmm. I, um, actually, uh, I'll give an example. I was at uh, this trauma release thing. I was observing and trying to think about how we might export some tools from my lab to that community and vice versa. Um, and a woman said, um, she said, look, I've enjoyed our interactions and I'm really glad you're here, but like, I'm really afraid of you because your voice reminds me of my dad. And I was like, I'm sorry. And she said, but it has nothing to do with the way your, your actual voice. It's just something about the, the resonant frequency of your voice just freaks me out. And it was, <laughs> and I was like, well, there's nothing I can do about that much. Right. But you know, opera singers, again, they tell me, because again, been spending time with them that w their goal is to get the audience. Sometimes the experienced ones, their goal is to get the audience feeling in their diaphragm, mm -hmm. what they feel. So establishing a resonant frequency, literally a frequency of vibration so that the person in the audience feels the sadness or anticipation or the elation that they feel, not by what they're hearing with their ears alone, by actually vibrating. Mm -hmm. Now it sounds very like woo, but the phrenic nerve firing and the diaphragm vibrating at the same frequency. We are on the same frequency and that's gonna be done through sound waves. Now animals do this. So fish have a lateral line that mm -hmm. senses electricity. They can sense electric fields in the water, yeah. right? The platypus senses electric fields with its bill. They can sense where things are, but also the energies of those things, right? Are, am I being pursued by a predator? Am I next to other fish that are um, a fish like me, mm -hmm. right? Is it a fish that wants to mate or a fish that wants to fight? Is it a fish that wants to bump me out of the way to mate with the fish next to me? This is what animals do, but they feel it in their body. Right. Humans, we tend to overemphasize the content of speech. And yeah. This is why online, the visceral part in the intention is completely lost. Yeah. It's like stripped down. So anyway, we can, um, since we were talking about relationships earlier, you I think- You still haven't given me your definition of love. All right, I'll do that right now. <laughs> do you have one? Yeah. Where the average resonant frequency, <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. Is similar? You know, I'm a sort of half kidding because there are couples that when you're around them, I have one friend in particular and his wife, they just have a, a new newborn son. He's about one now. And they are delightful people. Mm -hmm. Their son is delightful. He's just such a cool little kid. And when they're together, it's almost like everything just gets better for them and everyone around them. Mm -hmm. It's like, you just feel good. And it's not about what they're saying. It's not about how they touch each other or do anything like who knows what they do behind closed doors. None of my business. I don't want to know, but it just feels good to be around them yeah. because you can tell they just feel great as a unit. And I kind of hold them in my mind as kind of the, the best example of like, not because they have a kid it's not what it's about, but like love, it's just sort of, they bring out the best. We hear these That's phrases. That's a good definition. And they seem to do better they seem to do very well when they're together or apart. I see a lot of people that are like, they have to be like this yeah, or they have right. to be like this. I think everybody, you know, it's different for everybody. It's like interdependent, but yeah, it yeah. is a case by case thing. I think so. And I think their temperaments are just very well matched. Mm. You know, I, I look at people more or less as different species of animals, individuals, mm -hmm. you know, and they're whatever species match they are is just a good But are you, because I find myself sometimes, the more I learn about this, the more I start going like, okay, of course I have a crush on this person. I'm re releasing oxytocin and dopamine and, oh God, if we have sex, then I'll, have to, then I'll be attached to the person. Like I find myself trying to like- have to check if their shoes are off. I'm, just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like hack my own brain, hmm. you know, sometimes. So one of the, one of the um, greatest and worst features of the human brain is that can, it can think about itself. Yeah. Yeah. So 
that third personing is great and can be very adaptive or mm -hmm. it can interfere with just feeling in the feeling what we're feeling mm -hmm. and i'm not i'm not criticizing your response to that situation <laughs> you're but welcome to I, and i don't think we're just a bag of chemicals i think that we all should learn something about the chemicals yeah. but we should also learn to recognize the states in our mind and body that we like and that we mm -hmm. dislike and we should ask ourselves in a very direct way do i like it for good reasons adaptive Ooh, reasons good. or do i like it for maladaptive reasons are we supposed to go to sleep and wake up with the sun not necessarily sleep? sunrise and sunset but one of the most powerful things one can do for their mental and physical health is to view the sun with the eyes sunglasses off unless you have a retinal degenerative condition for two to ten minutes first thing in the morning you don't have to watch the sunrise but while what's it's called low solar angle when the sun isn't overhead yet so sometime before uh, 10 a.m or so noon if you slept in just do it anyway it triggers the cortisol and mel melatonin pathways in the brain and body to be in the right rhythms and then we definitely want to avoid really bright lights of any color mm -hmm. from the hours of about 11 p.m to 4 a.m wow Blue light glasses. We talk about a lot of the pod. I've convinced everyone to buy them. Did they all waste their yeah. money? <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea for people to avoid bright lights in the evening and night. And blue, blue blockers are one way to filter out bright light by where you can still see, you can still function safely. You can't really drive with sunglasses at night, mm -hmm. but you could wear blue blockers, yeah. I think. I don't know. I, don't, I personally don't wear them. I just dim the lights in my home at night. But what about on your phone? Um, well, I've texted you at odd hours of the night. Yeah, so you want to dim the screen on your phone as much as possible. Ooh. And you also want the lights low in your physical environment, mm -hmm. literally not overhead because the neurons in the eye that look, that send signals to the brain to wake up mm -hmm. are located in the lower portion of the eye, which means they look up in the visual field. So I, I always say the single best thing anyone can do for their mental and physical health is get some bright sunlight in their eyes in the morning. If there's cloud cover, you're still getting a lot more light than you'd ever get from an artificial light. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the depths of winter in Scandinavia, you might want to get an artificial light to do that. But for the most part, sunlight will do it. And then at night, you want to avoid bright lights from about 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. of all colors. Wear blue blockers if that's in your practice. Some people get you know headaches and migraines. We could talk, I know you talked about migraine. The same cells in the eye that set our circadian clocks and tell us when to wake up and when to sleep have a connection from the eye to an area of the brain that's in the thalamus called the anterior thalamus, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus that then projects the meninges, which are the, it's like the thick tissue that the brain is housed in. Yeah. You take off the skull and you look at a brain, you think it's just brain there. There's actually some stuff that looks like saran wrap. Yeah, yeah. But to get through that saran wrap, this stuff is tough. This stuff is like, you have to like really get through. I've had to cut through a lot of this stuff in my lifetime. And it's really thick fibrous tissue. This area of the brain projects there and it can cause um, photophobia and headache. So if yeah. you're getting a lot of bright lights, yes. then the blue blockers might be good for you because you can't wear sunglasses indoors. So you want to get a lot of bright light in your eyes during the day. Mm -hmm. You obviously never want to look at any light that's so bright that it hurts because mm -hmm. it can damage your retina. You don't want, I'm not talking about like staring at the sun, you know, that, that would damage your eye. But through a, wit a window, it's 50 fold weaker. So try and get outside to do this even yeah. briefly. And then in the, at night, avoid bright lights or wear the blue blockers. Migraine, yeah, I've I've finally at a, at a point in my life where I'm not debilitated by migraines every couple months, but I remember going to the ER at Cedars like when I was like 22 and I got migraines my whole life. Like when I was a kid, I was the one that ruined every field trip. I was the one that, you know, ruined the Disneyland trip. I was the one that like got the migraine and everybody had to like, you know, deal with me and drive me home and I couldn't be in light and I'd be puking and I couldn't see and the left side of my um, body would go numb and Wow, it's like, extreme. Like super, super yeah. intense. And there's a lot of things that I have done. I have just a list of, of um, like a list um, that I send people when they say they have migraines. I wrote all about it and, and I have a whole chapter on it in, in my book. But the first thing I always say is just wear sunglasses outside all the time mm -hmm. um, and get your vision checked because that's like one of the main triggers for migraines mm -hmm. is like squinting, triggering. Um, so blue light glasses I wear all the time. Um, grinding at night is a big one, like the lactic acid you produce from grinding at night in your muscles. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things that I've heard um, migraine doctors tell me over the years is that the migraine brain likes routine it wants the same uh, neurochemicals every day at the same time, every day, all the time. Mm. So it doesn't matter really what you eat. Uh, if you are allergic to 
sugar or gluten or whatever. I'm sure dairy is not super helpful, but whatever you eat or drink, uh, eat at the same time every day, basically. Yeah, so the three ways that, um, so every cell in our body has a clock, runs at 24 hours, which is not coincidentally in sync with the 24 hour spin of the earth once every cycle. This is not kind of like woo biology. It's like every cell has a genetic program to have a 24 hour clock. It needs to be synchronized. All those wow. clocks need to be synchronized. The only way we can synchronize those clocks is with light information delivered to the eyes, mm. not light on the skin. That's a whole nother business, but that's why the eyes are outside your head, outside your skull. That's why these two pieces of brain are outside your skull to inform the rest of your body and when it's night and when it's yes. daytime. We have lungs because we need, all our cells need oxygen. So we bring air into our lungs and then it goes to the bloodstream and distributes. We need light information for all the cells in our body. We do that by bringing them in through these things we call eyes. And then it's distributed to all the cells of the body. The light doesn't permeate. It's sent through electrical signals and neurons and chemicals. So getting that sunlight early in the morning is absolutely key. The next way you do it is with feeding time and exercise activity rhythms. So if you travel to Japan, let's say, and you're totally jet lagged, it takes a few days to catch up to the local pattern. But if you eat on the local schedule, yeah. you switch faster. If you exercise when people are active and you sleep when people are sleeping, you know, or you try and sleep when people are sleeping, you'll shift much, much quicker. So, but light is the quickest way yeah. to set these rhythms without question. A lot of people are jet lagged at home, especially now with their indoors. Yes. So they're like, I feel miserable. I'm disorder, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. Well, you're jet lagged, except you're jet lagging yourself in your apartment or home. I have so many more questions for you. Well, I can do a more ridiculous. rapid fire if you want. No, um, we're going to yeah. do, I'm going to make you do this again. I'm going to force sure, you either and way. I will publicly right. attack you if you don't. The what? Okay. The last, 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 last thing I'm asking you, I swear, is about ancestral trauma. And there's something called family constellation, which I know is thought of as like complete like fooey, but there is something to me to, and I don't know if it's nature or nurture, Family constellation is when you sort of learn about the trauma of your ancestors and learn what fears and phobias you've perhaps inherited. Heights is something that I, my guess is universal. Some are more afraid than others. Um, there was that uh, study uh, where mice, you might have actually done this study, uh, where mice um, got electrocuted every time they smelled cherry blossoms and their offspring when they smelled cherry blossoms mm. would recoil. Uh, babies are afraid of pictures of spiders, even though they don't consciously know what a spider is. You know, these things that um, were sort of uh, wired to be afraid of and how it's kind of specific to people. My um, ancestry uh, goes back to West Virginia to coal mines and, um, you know, whether this is just family lore or legend or whatever, like we're all kind of claustrophobic and big banging mm -hmm. sounds and sort of mm -hmm. uh, we all have misophonia and sort of, you know, which our theory is that it has to do with our ancestors being in coal mines and mine explosions and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I just, I'm curious if there's any science to the family constellation. Well, there's some emerging evidence that um, learning can be inherited. And these, you know, the original experiments were done in these, like these little flatworms. They're those like really boring species, but I guess if you like flatworms, they're really interesting, but <laughs> where they would shock them and then their offspring would respond to shock they would learn to kind of Pavlovian responses to things, even though the babies had never been exposed to that. Right. So um, sort of transgenerational trauma in worms of all things. And then there's some recent studies in mice, like the cherry blossom study, um, that some of this could be inherited in mice. Here's what we know for sure. We inherit genes from mom and dad. However, those genes are subject to what we call epigenetic regulation. So some of that epigenetic regulation can be in utero. So if our mom was really stressed, mm -hmm. right, it can cause release of, for instance, um, the the adrenals, the adrenal glands can release testosterone too. It can like um, can masculinize fetuses if it's really extreme, but under kind of more normal conditions, if like mom is really stressed, the baby might come out more aggressive because it has That's more me. more testosterone exposure during development, things like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's um there's also some really interesting stuff on what's called genomic imprinting. Mm -hmm. We love the idea that we get half our genes from mom and half from dad. And you know parents will always say, "Oh, that's exactly like you and yeah. that's exactly like you or that's like I'm being exactly like my dad or exactly like my mom." Turns out there's a woman at Harvard named Catherine Dulac and she had a postdoc named Chris Gregg who's now at the University of Utah and there are others who have done beautiful studies showing that in the brain there are some cells that are genetically identical to mom and mom only 
or mm. dad and dad only. So there are parts of your brain that very likely are genetically identical to one parent or the other. So the idea that we're just a mix of both parents, yeah. first of all, that's falling away. I think the modern genetics tells us that that's probably not true. What's hardwired and what's learned? That seems to be a kind of general theme running through everything today. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful theme because it, it, it's the most interesting theme in all of neuroscience, really, because it, it embodies everything. But here's what we know for sure. If a series of grandparents and parents and children are stressed in a particular way, the hormones and the neurochemicals that are secreted could have a very profound influence on those offspring. We know that there's, for instance, influenza in the first trimester. If the mom gets a flu, can predispose the offspring to certain kinds of neurologic issues later. Now, does that mean that every woman that gets flu during her first trimester is going to have a child that's somehow messed up? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. But it shifts the bias towards more probability that there will be these neurologic syndromes. So immune infection, you know, Im immune compromise or infection, trauma, it's all translated into chemical responses in the body. And so I do think that offspring can inherit some of this stuff. I, um, I meant to raise this earlier, so I'll just kind of, I'll add to this topic something that's very related. I think it's useful for people to, if they're thinking about their brain and their nervous system to think about what's non-negotiable and what's negotiable, hmm. what's unique to the individual and what's inherited. And I think vision provides a beautiful example. So the biologist Torrenson Wiesel and David Hubel, um, they discovered these periods of critical period plasticity, won the Nobel Prize for that. They also won the Nobel Prize for showing that the cells, the neurons in the eye respond to little circles. That's the only thing they see. The world is a bunch of little circles to the eye. Hmm. That information is then passed to the brain where those little circles are aligned into little lines. So everyone kind of constructs a kind of outline of everything they look at. All animals do this. Humans are very dependent on facial expressions. So all humans have a face area. Some people like my postdoc advisor were terrible at recognizing faces. Some people are phenomenal at and now looking that we at have faces. to wear masks, none of it matters. That's right. But <laughs> everyone has neurons that respond to these little dots, these little lines and faces. Some people better than others. That's all true. That's all non-negotiable across our species. But then it starts to get into some really interesting nuance. There was a study that was published in Nature a few years ago asking a kind of classic question in neuroscience that relates directly to what you're asking, which is, do we have what are called grandmother cells? Do we have neurons in our brain that represent my grandmother for me and your grandmother for you in particular? Not all grandmothers, mm -hmm. but your grandmother, yeah. my grandmother. And it's amazing because it turns out that people have these cells. I have a neuron in my brain that when it fires, I think of my grandmother or I see an image of her in my mind's eye, okay? When I look at a picture of her, that neuron fires. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of funny but not so but really important aspect to this study which was that they brought in a subject they were showing them lots of different faces and they this subject unlike all the other subjects had a neuron that only responded to the face of jennifer aniston <laughs> neuroscientists know about these about this discovery it was published in the journal nature which is our kind of uh, super bowl of publishing very very stringent journal very high quality journal maybe the most high quality and stringent journal. So this particular subject, I don't recall if the subject was male or female, has a neuron in their head, assuming the subject is still alive. They're walking around out there. And when they think about Jennifer Aniston, that neuron and only that neuron and maybe a few other neurons around it is electrically active. When that neuron is electrically active, they think of Jennifer Aniston, they see her in their mind's eye. So does that mean that everyone has a cell that represents Jennifer Aniston? No. In fact, if I'm talking about someone right now named Jennifer Aniston and you don't know who that is, which is a, seems, like a very, seems like a pretty low probability event, <laughs> but if there's somebody out there who's like, who is he talking about? They don't have such a cell. So what this means is that everybody's brain has certain things that are common to all of us. And everybody's brain has real estate and neurons that are tuned specifically to their unique experience. Okay, so I have a Jennifer Aniston cell, right? Because you know who she is. If you close your eyes, you can imagine who she is and what she looks like. Okay. You probably even see it as I'm saying this. That means for sure that you have a representation of Jennifer Aniston in your head as the firing of neurons in a particular sequence. Yes. But is it one little cell? It's probably a collection of cells. And it doesn't spell Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> 
<laughs> but there's, you, I'm fascinated by, like, you know how when you think of someone, like, one visual comes up of them? Right. Like, that... It, it, That's right. You know? And I'm, the reason for that is really interesting. The reason for that is that these cells in our visual cortex, as it's called, mm -hmm. this face area, have direct connections to the areas of the brain that we call the limbic system. They're involved in emotion. So, let's say someone was really awful to you. Yeah. You have neurons that are strongly connected to the neurons that convey a sense of awfulness and yeah. you will never forget their face or their voice yes. or their anything. Yes. People that are kind of neutral, you walk past people all the time on the street, you see people online all the time, you will never need to know them and your brain just throws out that But that's our reptilian brain's way of saying, remember this right. person, they're dangerous, right. they're scary. Right, so what people seem to overlook in the discussion of neuroscience is that, typically overlook in the discussion of neuroscience is that these lizard brain areas and these higher areas, they are intimately connected. They're direct, what we call monosynaptic, direct connections. It's not like you have to go through three or four different stations, right? It's like New York to LA flight, it's direct. The primitive areas of our brain are linked to the more sophisticated areas of our brain. They're not so separate. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that when you think about something kind of neutral or somebody, you know, it's like, eh, you see somebody who's really triggering or that you like very much and, and it's instantaneous, it captures a whole bunch of your neural circuitry and maybe even a, a response in your body. I won't ask you if, you know, the Jennifer Aniston uh, <laughs> example <laughs> captures a response in your body or not, but Larry, you just smiled Jealousy. Big. So there you go. So it's linked to something. <laughs> it's linked to something. And so I raise this example, A, because there's experimental evidence in a very rigorous laboratory study. But what it means is really important. It means that Yes, we have a map of our own unique experience in our minds. We're each showing up to the table with a different toolkit, mm -hmm. with a different filter and a different way of looking at things. But there are a lot of things, the chemicals and the deeper circuits, in particular of the limbic system and the hypothalamus, that are universal. And that's why putrid things smell, smell gross yeah. and why we avoid them and, you know, unless we have some weird you know, proclivity for them. How do you have so much energy? And, oh, do <laughs> you get tired? Uh, was, I thought it was a scientific question. It always takes me a second. <laughs> um, sure, I sleep very well. Um, yeah. I definitely I do that yoga nidra thing mm -hmm. usually. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of energy because I, I love this topic. I, yeah. I love. I mean, Jennifer Aniston's yeah. great too. But <laughs> but but I mean, that, I'm super excited it, when I think about Jennifer. No, I think <laughs> neuroscience in general. Yeah. I just you know I feel so blessed. I feel like I'm a brain explorer. That's what I do. I spend a lot of time in looking around in physical brains, recording from physical brains and talking and thinking about the brain and nervous system. And for me, it was, like it was just, um, you know, I teach neuroanatomy. I see it as beautiful. Yeah. You know, I look at a brain and I go, oh my God, that's yeah. amazing. Like look at the old factory bulbs on that hyena <laughs> or whatever. So to me, it's, it's thrilling, but I think, I don't know, it's probably how you feel when you do comedy. It's like, you know, I, I think I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I've got infinite energy for it. Who knows? There are other topics that just put me to sleep right away. Do you like doing podcasts? Uh, I've enjoyed this one a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I've laughed a lot, which has been a lot of Do you have any questions for me? Loads of questions. <laughs> no, you don't. You know, but, <laughs> Do you have any questions for me about neurology? Um, Ask me any question. Let's see if I can answer it. Uh, really? Yeah. Do you want to do like 10 questions <laughs> in neurology? Like a, let's just like test my knowledge of... Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, uh, do you, what does amygdala mean? Oh, like what is it? It's what? the fear center of the brain that... Oh, no, not what does it do. What does it mean? Why is it called amygdala? Am amygdala means... Scared. Almond. <laughs> oh, that's right when I did know that. shaped like an I almond. I did know that. This right. makes me so All right, let's try another one. Fucking mad. I'm used to giving exams. Let's try I another one. I actually did know that. Okay. What, is that in my, I need to have been traumatized when I learned that for it to have started. While eating almonds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what does hippocampus mean? Think about the shape. I'll give you a hint. Looks like a hippo. Seahorse, but close, ah, but not it. quite so. Okay, um, let's think of another one. Um, this is like the etymology of neurology terms. Let's see. Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, do I get a moment to think? Of course. There's a podcast, so it's like it's cl the times. Yeah, okay. no, please. Um, People stick with us. They're loyal. Right. Um, You're trying oh, to think of a question for a stupid person. Yeah, no, I, I just, I, I'm trying to think. Oh, okay. Um, oh, what, what type of animal is a platypus? Like, is it a mammal? Is it a, what is it? It falls into a specific category and there's only one other animal in it's this category. Fuck. This is kind of arcane knowledge. This is annoying. 
Well, I can tell you what horses and goats and all that. Is. What are Ungu- they? Those are ungulates, ungulates, right? Yeah. So this is like. Yeah, it's like you've got carnivore, of- herbivore, ungulates. Like, what is it? Um, starts with an M. It's not a mammal. It's a weird one. This feels. All right. It's a mono. I feel it's a monotreme. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And the echidna is the only other one. All right, and then we'll do one more Word kind of. Alert. Ner- this is you asked me to ask you questions. Um, this is too nerdy even for me. All right, uh, last one. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, no, I, I got this. All right, but um, that's zoology, neurology. Okay. Um, I made a movie about this, so I might know some, but. Oh, this is... I think I know more than I do. What's that neurological condition called? Uh, <laughs> Narcissism? Yeah. Delusion? Um, <laughs> hmm. What do you do? You know a little history of neuroscience? I, I mean, answer. no. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to ask you a question. I think uh, that, I can name sure. the female neurologists that you named during this podcast. Oh, cool. Nancy and Carla. Wow. So that's impressive. <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do that for knowledge I didn't have. Oh, really? That's really, yeah. Nancy Cannon, wish her caller shouts. That's great. Um, I don't remember their last names. But. That's No, that's really good. Um, anyway, we don't have to. Uh, <laughs> Quiz you know, me. What's that? Oh, what are the spaces in the brain? Like the holes, like the ones that have fluid in them that are meant to be there. Do you know what those like things are? I know that benzodiazepines make holes in your brain. <laughs> Do you need a new RA? I feel like I'm. You can. T- I teach you. The holes in your brain. I t- they're called ventricles. Anyway, this you is. You know this that is, I know the word, but I don't. This know. is getting really nerdy, but they, <laughs> I like it. Anyway, I teach a neuroanatomy course. I teach neuroscience. Um, uh, I, I'll be happy to teach you, you whatever neuroscience <laughs> you want to know. So. Um. Uh. F- mm. You could ask me questions about comedy. I'm not gonna know. Right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, you asked me three of those. I don't. Okay. Know. Um. But be gentle. <laughs> I'm trying to think of one that are as difficult as the ones you just asked me. Those would be like, what was the name of Steve Martin's first special or something? I don't even know that. Mm. That would be arcane. Who is a... I don't, yeah, this is hard. It's hard. I, it's yeah, hard right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Why yeah. is that so hard? I think it's because like rote memory for like what is what is mm-hmm. not actually how your brain works. And it's also not how my brain works. Mm-hmm. I'm good at memorizing things, but more this, what we really try to emphasize today is like processes, thinking about like logic and process, how things fit together. And that's actually much more useful yeah. than memorizing long lists of names or names of things. It's actually to know that a platypus is a monotreme is totally useless. Your hippocampus is smart. And just not in, in, a, in let not, it stick. Yeah. Can you remember your childhood phone number? 202. Well, well I. D- you sure you still want to give this out? <laughs> to, I'll do, yeah, no, I'll do this. My mom's was after my parents got divorced, which mm-hmm. is a traumatic event, which might have been why I remembered it better. It was 202 625 7238. Right. Totally useless now do, unless the number still exists. Right? I can do it from 202 237 78. Or two. Like I could do it if you gave it to me, I could do it by muscle memory. Mm-hmm. So that's incredible, right? Because how long ago was that number active? I guess 30 years. But you pass numbers every day yeah. that, that you don't. So, I mean, that's stored in your brain. It's occupying real estate. So knowing some names of things in neuroscience and what they mean and amygdala is yeah, just, yeah, it's yeah. useless. Yeah. I teach neuroanatomy. It's useful for me. It's useless. So, so you get an A for adaptable, <laughs> for adaptability of knowledge. Um, you got, yeah, an effort sort of rote memory, but rote memory is is useless in many cases. Is there anything yeah. to say? Uh, uh, Jay Z says if you want to memorize something, you have to say it eighteen times. Is there any? Did he say that? Science that times? well, he said <laughs> <laughs> he said something about like I remember this guy interviewed him and was like, "How do you memorize your lyrics or your songs or whatever?" Mm. He said, "You just say them eighteen times." And I think there was supposedly some kind of logic to that. Mm. I think the more attention you can bring to something. Mm-hmm. Um, the fewer repetitions it requires. Yeah. Why because can I? Why do I know all the songs from an Alanis Morissette song that I haven't heard in twenty years? Because they were they get they grabbed some emotional state in you, mm-hmm. or the rhythm is easily encoded, so that there was acetylcholine turned on in your brain at the time of encoding. It was because they had a acetylcholine is like a highlighter. It was like this is important, and you didn't have to Whoa. consciously decide that. And your brain's like you know. People will never forget that there's a guy named Fauci who has something to do with this COVID communication thing ever. His name is forever embedded in your brain. Because, like him or hate him, yeah. his brain is for his name is forever embedded in your brain. You cannot expunge that unless you get brain damage and you damage your hippocampus. Because of how much acetylcholine we're producing right now, it was, we're in time of stress. It was coupled to a time when we were paying attention. That's how the brain works. I could do this all day, and I frankly might. I'm tempted. 
this is my dream. So what do you want from people? Like follow on Instagram. Oh, I thought you meant Andrew, in general. You, you, you asked me a lot of personal questions, <laughs> as I was, or you tried. Um, uh, what do I want? Um, you can really bob and weave. His uh, uh, Instagram is amazing. He does these videos just on little things here and there. I'm um, going to make you get on the community app and give out your phone number to everybody. Um, so you can start targeting videos and sending things out to people more specifically. Um, but your Instagram is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I've really enjoyed teaching neuroscience on Instagram. So it's Huberman Lab. And I do some descriptions of neuroscience and psychology and biology, a lot of the kinds of things I was talking about today, but also a lot of actionable tools mm -hmm. as they relate to stress management and sleep and light. And I host people on there, like experts in um, sleep and circadian rhythm, shift mm -hmm. work, autism and Alzheimer's, people like that are going to be coming on, people oh, nice. from my community. I'll so, do it. Um, perfect. Fine. Yeah, you know, perfect. So, Fine. Um, yeah, that's where people can find me. And um, I'm pretty easily, my email and stuff is pretty easily found on the web. If what? People, yeah. It's just the virtue. It's just the way academics exist in the world, you know. Finally, why don't you tell everyone since we um, mentioned in the beginning, but then ignored it of our, how we met or how we've, our from past. Right. So, <laughs> right. This, uh, this is the second time we've met with a, with a, uh, a gap in between of three years. I always have a microphone in front of me. <laughs> um, three years ago on New Year's, yeah. I was in Portland visiting friends mm -hmm. and I went to go see you do stand up <laughs> that night. It was New Year's <laughs> Eve. And who I, a woman who I thought was your twin sister, not because you looked <laughs> exactly alike, but because you told everybody she was your twin sister, jumped up out of the audience and got on stage with you. And that was kind of the closing <laughs> act. But anyway, the act was super funny. And it wasn't closing act it was a surprise to me too oh wait i had no idea she was gonna be there i thought no i had never met her before i thought it was oh, all right i'm this totally is, confused no this is wild women are confusing i know it's a nightmare i went to portland was performing on new year's eve i think i was running a special this must have been my hbo special or something i think i was dating someone in portland at the time we all make mistakes and uh it was a mistake because of who they were because they were in portland <laughs> I happen to, I happen in defense of Portland. I, like I Portland. love Portland. Yeah. I haven't been there recently. I know it's a city that's struggling with a lot of issues right now. But well, apparently um, it's not that big of a thing. Apparently yeah, the news have, is kind of blowing it a little. I have to more. assume those cameras don't extend across all the blocks and. Yeah, it feels and, like it's it's yeah. a little clickbaity at this point. But no, I love Portland um, very deeply, and so uh, and the crowds there are just so fucking smart and great. So I think I went there because I was trying to run my special right before I shot it because Portland's always just a great judge. Like they're smart. Uh, they're incisive, but they still like to have fun and party and they don't take themselves too seriously. So it's a great place to run a special. I was doing New Year's shows are tough. Like it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, people want the crescendo end to their year. And you have to like save marriages in that show. Like this is like like you can tell there's so much pressure on you to be a great, you know, uh, performance for a date. You know, like it's just like they've paid money. It's their New Year's, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like always just like a little bit stressful to do New Year's shows. And I show up to the venue and I'm like, I'm a little bit like dressed up because it's a New Year's show and I walk in and the bouncer looks at me and is like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? What are you doing? Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, what do you mean? What am I doing here? It's my show. What are you talking about? And he was so weirded out and he was so aggressive with me and I didn't understand what was going on. And then I go upstairs and the second bouncer is like, hey, wh how did you, why are you in this room? And I was like, what is happening? Like, oh, it was the other I was, the other yeah, I was so like, why is everyone asking me what I'm doing and where I'm going? And, and people looked like they had seen a ghost when they saw uh -huh. me walk in. And then what I go on stage and New Year's Eve shows never go particularly well. So I'm not convinced. It was, it was a really good show. Thank you. I didn't know that we were going to interact later, three years later. That we were gonna <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't make fun of you. How were you close to the front? I was right up front. Really? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't make fun of you? No. I didn't talk to you at no, all? I was, no. I was prepared for you to do that because I've been to one or two other comedy shows. I'm and you're, shocked. Oh, I was right there. Yeah. You, maybe you're in panoramic vision. Wow. Oh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah, no, I would have said, because I would have been like, what are you doing? You've been like a neurologist. And I would have been like, oh my God, you're like, are, like we would have had this discussion, yeah, we but then <laughs> you were no, sat down. Because you look like a Marvel scientist. You look like a, like I who would like be a neurologist. Yes. A neurologist, like in a Marvel movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just what you look like too. So I'm sure I would have um, not believed that you were a neurologist, but so I get on stage and I don't know what's happening. I'm like going to get a drink of water or something. And then a girl just yells out. She's like, our friend looks exactly like you. And I was like, okay. And for some reason, maybe it's because it was New Year's Eve and, you know, the vibe was good. And um, I was like, all right, fine. Just have her come up here. You know, and all, when people tell me that I look like them, it always ends up hurting my feelings. But I was just like, come up, come on. And she came up and truly. You look similar. 
I wouldn't say you were identical she, twins. Maybe you were dichorionic, not monochorionic twins. Remember earlier? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I do remember that. No, no, I wasn't producing acetylcholine, so I don't remember. But um, and she came up, and it was such a. Cra- and I mean, the audience like went crazy. I had never seen her before. I had, and the bouncers had seen her walk in, and then seen me walk in five minutes later. Also that night, her hair was done similar to yours, and like it was. Didn't I make her get on stage and yeah. like get on the microphone? And you guys took a picture together, and I was convinced that she was actually your twin sister. No. Because you said so. No. You're like, it's my twin. And then I was like, oh, I guess they're twins. And then the person maybe, that I was at. Maybe I had met her before. I think she came to okay. my book, a book signing like a couple years prior. So maybe by the okay. time you saw, I had met her before. And then two days later or something, we were talking about it. The person I went to the show with. And they were like. You guys were like and, obsessed with me. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. The person I went with was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Person, you were just talking about how pretty I am. Or? No. All right. Well, so be, I, I'm a nascent fan of <laughs> comedy. <laughs> All right. I'll just say it. I didn't know who you were before that night. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm a scientist. I didn't know. I I knew very like I knew who Lenny Bruce was. Your hippocampus I, is a like, mess. Like Eddie Murphy. Like I I've been in a lab a lot of years. Yeah. But the person that I was with at the time was like really excited about your work and so i got tickets and yeah. that was so that was the first, first yeah night. i mean people have to come to the table sooner or later yeah right? Right? yeah That's no i get a lot of guys that meet me for the first time because their girl like drags them to come see me and it's like you have to come see whitney and they're like i didn't want to i really did not want to see a female comic and then the show was great Thanks. i became a fan <laughs> i thought that was your twin sister until two days later the person i was there with revealed to me that, oh no, that wasn't actually her sister. That was just a spontaneous thing. And it took me a couple minutes to really adjust because I had to reframe all the stuff that had happened. That's weird. I mean, I mean, it wasn't like hugely impactful in my life, but I attached <laughs> it's enough. It's all you think about. I had attached it's enough. <laughs> I had attached enough to it that it, um, it kind of threw me for a loop. Impactful. Yeah. So um, anyway, it was a really funny show. And then, and then three years later, I are. think it was after um, the Rogan podcast, mm-hmm. and you asked a question, and we started talking about neuroscience. And well, actually, we, we met because my therapist, who hates everyone, told me about you. <laughs> Do you realize that that probably means that she hates me? Is that what you're? No, she loves you. Oh, okay. Plot twist. The way the way you. She thinks it. everyone's full of shit. She's like, don't read that self help book. That one's not true. That's not real science. That's not attachment strategy. Like she's constantly like debunking a lot of the things that I, you know. Um, I'm exploring and she's like, don't read that. Don't do that. That doesn't work. That doesn't make well, sense. There's some crazy stuff out there's there. There's some crazy shit yeah. out there. And I certainly don't have all the answers. I just happen to put a scientific lens on. No, but she about. loves you. And she told me to start following you on Instagram. Okay. Well, whoever she is, thank you. And um, I'm glad that you did because this was. Yeah, I don't think that I don't think she wants yeah. people to publicly know she's my therapist. Um, probably would be. <laughs> Yeah, I work with Whitney Cummings. Um, <laughs> that makes you that makes you the that makes you the litmus test yeah, of whether or not she could. Right, depending on how well you're doing or not. That's, what I'm that's her. That's I don't her think she wants base. me to be her like right. storefront. Interesting. <laughs> I don't think she wants me to be the example of her work. And it's a lot of pressure on you too because if you don't, if something happens. Know, yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm not gonna say. But um, so um, follow him. Uh, watch uh, the Rogan podcast if you have not already. It was so informative, so clear. You're so good at doing this. I hope you'll still um how many videos a week are you doing i try and do two or three weeks some are longer and they take longer to digest yeah there's some you know it's impossible to have a really good discussion about science without including the names of some brain areas and things like that Mm -hmm. and and i believe you know there's a famous scientist max delbrook that said assume zero knowledge and infinite intelligence um i'm not sure i completely agree with that but Mm -hmm. in teaching i just assume people don't know anything about the topic so they can show up without any prior knowledge but that if they're delivered the information in a way that's reasonable and thoughtful that hopefully they'll take away some kernels of information such a fan what a treat i end these very awkwardly Well, I'm a fan as well, so thank you. (laughs) Okay, thank you, everybody. Don't ride elephants. Love you. Bye.